God bless you, everybody. Love to everybody out there. Uh, I'm having problems with my internet. I tried to go on the show uh, with uh, Amza and Ijaz, but they have a platform like Zoom, not Zoom, but something like Zoom with their YouTube, and it's caused me problems. Uh, I couldn't go on, but I went on for a few minutes, and then uh, I've tried to do a YouTube, live YouTube, it's not very good, but it seems to be a little bit better with Facebook for some reason, so I'm, I've come on Facebook and I'm going to do my scholarship and reply to Hamza. Now I'm going to show you the work that I've done for these guys, okay, so... I don't want it to go away, so this is in reply to Hamza and Ijaz. My first reply uh, to Hamza and Ijaz is about Josephus and Tacitus. They dismissed them in the fifth video. They they dismissed um, Josephus and Tacitus and said they're not important. Uh, and they just dismissed it. So I went on the show, I was able to challenge them and it made them think and it stopped them from being um, cocky as they were but then they started laughing again but so I'm going to go and talk to you what what I said I went on the show and I said that you dismissed Josephus as not important as evidence because you said they got it from the Christians and it was just hearsay and I said to them well if we go to the um, first of all I said that if you look at Josephus uh, scholarship. If you look at uh, his writing on against Appion, he uses a variety of sources, uh, and, and he and he maps out his method of historiography. He likes to use a variety of sources. So to say that Josephus has just used the Christian source is is just not fair to his 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 historiography, his method. So that was point one. That stopped them in the tracks. Then we went to the text, and I went to the I went to the Arabic. Josephus there's a number of manuscripts and I said let's go to the Arabic Josephus and I read it out for them and uh, in it it says this um, the Arabic says about this time lived uh, Jesus a wise man if indeed one ought to call him a man for he was the achiever of extraordinary deeds and was a teacher of those who accept the truth gladly he won over many Jews and many of the Greeks who was the Messiah. When he was indicated by the principal men among us and Pilate condemned him to be crucified, those who had come to love him originally did not cease to do so, for he appeared to them on the third day restored to life. And countless other marvellous things about him, and the tribe of the Christians so named after him was not disappeared to this day. So I said that uh, there's a misrepresentation by Muslims about the scholarship of Josephus, that Adan, uh, a, a Muslim historian, um, has said that most uh, scholars say this is a full interpolation. That's not true. Uh, most scholars believe some of it's an interpolation. They believe that some monk, somebody put in the bit about the resurrection, the bit about the Messiah. But most scholars believe that the bit about the crucifixion under Pontius Pilate to Josephus, and that is um, what Vermeer's uh, a scholar has said. Now, Hamza asked me a question. Well, you accept this great authority, but do you agree with him on the resurrection bit? And I said no. And then he laughed. He said, "Well, you're using this great authority to say that most scholars die, say that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate, but now you're throwing them under the bus." when it comes to the resurrection. I said, well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that um, that uh, if you look at the history of scholarship, there's been biased against miracles. Okay. And secondly, so anything that's about the resurrection, they're going to doubt. And then, uh, secondly, on the issue of Messiah, Vermeer, who's the word authority, is a Jew. So he's bound to not like the passage. But I'm not arguing for the authenticity of all the text. I wasn't making that argument. So Hamza was trying to trap me there. All the argument that I was making is you can't dismiss this source uh, about Jesus' crucifixion. The, the, the issue is, did Jesus cry? 
that did Jesus Christ die under Pontius Pilate? That's the issue. Whether he was the Messiah, whether he was resurrected, that's another debate. And this is solid evidence. It's solid evidence. And I tried to help him, them understand that, that you have a variety of ways of, of knowing whether it's evidence or not. Multiple attestation. There's other attestation, Tacitus. And enemy attestation. This is an enemy. Josephus is an enemy, even though it's good stuff. Now, if this is genuine Josephus, well, why didn't Josephus uh, believe? Well, he could have... Uh, I believe it was in all the manuscripts, and it, 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 I believe it was genuine, because even when you go back to Origen, Origen had to make it clear that Josephus had not been converted. So, obviously, this text was around in the time of Origen. So, it shows you that this is a very early source. And... Um, he obviously believed uh, that Jesus Christ was a very, very special person. Okay, so this cannot be thrown under the bus. It's better on Facebook. So I'm on Facebook. It's okay, but I'm better. It's better on false Facebook. It's working. So that's Josephus. So anyhow, they dismissed Josephus. But now they have to discuss it even more. So this is this is clear evidence that he was crucified. It's enemy attestation. Multiple and you can't just dismiss Josephus. Now I have a book here by um, by F.F. Bruce. Now even scholars who are not Christian respect F.F. Bruce. He's, he was an evangelical. Now when he's writing on on uh, sorry, when he's writing on when when he's writing on uh, the life of Jesus in here, he mentions Josephus and Tacitus. He goes straight to Josephus and straight to Tacitus. And any historian that's going to write on the life of Jesus has to go to Tacitus and Josephus. And so for, 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 uh, and, 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 and Ever Bruce says, talks about that Tacitus would have got his information from the police of the time. He would have, they would have had Roman soldiers, police, getting information. So that's how Tacitus got his information. And also he would have got it from the records in Rome. So to say that Tacitus and Josephus just, uh, got it from the Christians and they were deceived is absolute nonsense. So the Muslims can't dismiss this in, this uh, Tacitus and Josephus. But we've looked at a bit of Josephus scholarship. So uh, F. F. Bruce, when he's doing history, has to go straight to it. So that's the first. Um, so we're we're discussing: Did Jesus Christ die on a cross? Is there historical evidence for that? And we have here Josephus, a Jewish historian, writes writes that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. So there's your evidence. Josephus, a Jewish historian, who, who lived not long after Jesus, says that he died. All right. So when Muslims, scholars and debaters say, oh, dismiss Josephus, and, and misrepresent, misrepresent Joseph schol Josephus' scholarship, Adan, a Muslim apologist, dis uh, dismissed Josephus' scholarship. Now, this has to be remembered that you can't just dismiss Josephus. He is, a, he is a very good historian. He gets multiple sources when he writes something. He gives you that in his against Apion, his, his historiography. So please uh, remember Josephus. Do not let the Muslims think you can dismiss uh, that. So... The next thing I want to uh, tackle is Hamza and Ijaz, and I think it's important, on the issue of uh, bias. Uh, Muslim scholars and debaters, when they're tackling the historical Jesus studies and say Jesus didn't die under Pontius Pilate, they come across as if they're objective. They come across as if they're looking at the evidence in an objective way. 
But I've said in, in, in a video before, but I'm, I'm just going to give the background before I go into it a little bit more. But in the, in, in the history of historical Jesus studies, there has been a lot of bias. And if, when we're writing history, every one of us is biased. So, for example, H.S. Ramirez, 1694, 1768, Jesus was a Jewish revolutionary. Why did he write that? Because he had revolutionary tendencies. D.F. Strauss, 1808, 1874, Jesus was a myth. The New Testament was a projection of the church onto fictional past. Why did D.F. Strauss write that Jesus was a myth? Because he didn't believe in the supernatural. He, did, he believed what Hume said, that there could not be any miracles. Ernest Renan. 1823, 92, Jesus was a romantic visionary. Why did he write that? Because he was a romantic writer, romanticist writer. Um, and then we could uh, look at Rudolf Bootman, 1884 to 1976. He was a Jewish preacher of timeless truths, using his existentialism to reconstruct him. So Rudolf Bootman, one of the great academics of all time in the modern times, when he was writing on Jesus, it was his existential philosophy behind his biblical studies. You see the bias. So where do we get that? So I, I just want to talk about uh, a couple of atheists. Richard uh, Dawkins, uh, sorry, Christopher Hitchens said Jesus was an avatar. Didn't look at the scholarship. Um, so you can read his page, um, God is not great, page 40, 51, 60, 64. Christopher Hitchens didn't engage with uh, uh, historical Jesus studies so when he talked about Jesus he was biased he wasn't even engaging in objective scholarship the American Sam Harris in the end of faith an atheist in page 35, 96, 97, 82, 83 he talks about Jesus and, and says that the, the, the gospels are anti-semitic why does he do that? because he's an atheist but he's also Jewish and he believes that the early church was Catholic and anti-semitic so he doesn't do any objective scholarship on the history of Jesus. Michael Onfray, the French philosopher, in his book Atheist Manifesto, page 115, 127, says Jesus' existence has not been historically established. He makes great sweep, sweeping claims, but fails to cite scholars and evidence to back up his claim. So these are great atheists, and they have not done any real solid historical objective study of the life of Jesus. So now let's get to to uh, the Muslims. So, if we go to um, Surah 4157, Surah 4, Surah 4, 7, Surah 4, Surah 4, 157. They declared, We have put to death the Messiah, Jesus the son of Mary, the messenger of God. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it only seemed to them as if it had been so. So, here in the Quran, it's very clear that it says that Jesus did not die on a cross. They, he calls the Messiah and that Jesus didn't die on a cross. Now, this is influencing the Muslim apologists. This verse says that Jesus did not die. He was not crucified. So as a Muslim apologist, when you're doing your historical studies on Jesus, you are not looking at the text objectively. You are using the Quran to interpret the Gospels. You are using the Quran to interpret the Apostle Paul. That is your paradigm. But the Muslims will not be honest about their paradigm. They will not tell you what their paradigm is. So, for example, um, if you were to study the uh, historiography, the science of hadiths, the Muslims have a science of hadiths. And as they study the science of hadiths, they have certain criteria how they uh, verify something is true or not in history concerning Muhammad. 
Now, most secular scholars uh, in the academic West don't rate this, me this historical method that they use, okay? Because a lot of their sources, um, they list a lot of um, their sources. I'll just get, get the information here. I've got the information here. They have uh, a massive list of, just trying to get it for you, yeah, here, they have a massive list of what they say are early sources of Muhammad. Now this massive list, there's no original writing of these people, but these are supposedly the earliest sources of Muhammad, but this massive list is found in people like Bukhari, a couple of hundred years after Muhammad. And even in Bukhari, these sources, uh, even in Bukhari, Bukhari manuscript comes like the first bit of Bukhari that we get in a book is about the 10th century AD. So that, that's 630, that's 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 450 years after Muhammad, we start to get sources uh, about, uh, about Muhammad. All right. But they claim that they have these early sources, but they're in Bukhari, and Bukhari, the first book, is 8th century AD, but his book is a copy, first, and not all of his books, 10th century. Now, Bukhari had a hundred, hundreds of thousands of these stories of Muhammad, and he threw them away, and he chose the bits that he liked. So all this evidence about Muhammad has, has been doctored, it's been manipulated, the traditions have been manipulated, first uh, by Bukhari and others through this history. Now, the point what I'm getting at is this. They have also, uh, this is an article by a Muslim. Uh, it's called Christian Missionaries on the Historical Method and Science of Hadith by Bazam Zawadi. So this is a Muslim writer. And he's criticizing Christians. So I'm using their sources here. What I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to show you, is when Hamza and Hijaz are engaged in critical analysis of the New Testament, they have this massive science of hadith where they have to check the original saying of Muhammad and with witnesses and all the rest of it. And it's a lot of nonsense, the, the methodology, because many Western scholars don't respect it. But the point is, it's a massive science according to them with all these so-called sources. And the point is, when they're critiquing the, Bi the Bible, they have all this in their head, all this hadith scholarship. But they don't tell you about it. They don't tell you that that really is behind what they're doing when they're attacking the Bible, critiquing the Bible. And when they come to any sources that they don't like, it's because of the, what their belief in the Quran and their belief in their traditions. So they'll throw under a buzz any evidence, Josephus or anything, any way they can try and get around it, any way they can try and push it away, they'll do it. But they won't tell you, they won't be honest with you about this massive, uh, I said massive scholarship. It's scholarship not respected by the West because, excuse me, it's been corrupted over time. And their methodology, as, as, as um, they say, it developed early, but the, the fact of verifying a lot of the data has been manipulated over time. And the proof of that in Bukhari threw a lot of the hadiths away. So, so remember that when the Muslims start to critique the historical Jesus studies, they're not playing fair. Right? They're not playing fair. Because they're not being honest with you about their bias. They have a massive bias. They're just not telling you about this massive hadith scholarship, when I say massive, it's got lots of writers, lots of thinkers, lots of people, lots of methodologies, and that is how they understand history, but they're not telling you what that method is, how they use that method, or anything. And, and so they're being dishonest with you. Now, the other thing that I want to get to, which I think is important, um,
And then, for example, uh, the Islamic view of death in uh, the Quran, Surah 39, 42, Surah 3, 145, Surah 50, 43, Surah 8, 17, uh, Surah 2, 145. Uh, there's lots of teaching in the Quran about death. That one theology of death and also the theology of prophet, these influence their mind when they're studying the Bible. And when they're looking at text, they, they pull text here and there. They look at historical data about historical Jesus studies. But the theology of death, the theology of prophet, this verse about Jesus didn't die in the Quran, uh, the Hadith scholarship, all this is in their mind influencing how they're looking at the evidence. So they are biased, but they acknowledge it. Secondly, here on this issue, um, which has to be stated. Ijaz loves to uh, ask questions about the text. Love to ask uh, questions about the text. Ijaz loves to ask questions about the text. He'll say, like, is some Christian, like for example, one Christian brought up the argument from 1 Corinthians 15 and said, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, is this, the Christian said, uh, an apologist on his show, uh, this is an early source of Jesus. Uh, it's got uh, eyewitness material in this that goes back within the first years of Jesus, which most scholars. Now, Ijaz was said, yeah, but what's, what's your Greek text, what's your Greek manuscript that you're using? And then he said, did you know that there are uh, textual variants with that verse? And so the Christian apologist was like, uh, well, yeah, but most scholars believe. And he said, yeah, well, what about the text? What's the text? Well, I don't know. Well, you need to find out then, don't you? So he really, he really gets Christian apologists because he, he corners them on this issue of text. Not that Christians can't answer it, it's because it's a very specialist area, unless you spend a lot of time studying textual criticism, it's very difficult to deal with, with him. But the thing is, is that he's using, he's using um, here, I have, <laughs> I have here, um, Greek, Greek, uh, some Greek academic stuff. I have an interlinear, this is, a, I think it's in Polish, but a Greek interlinear in Polish. Uh, but the Greek is Greek. But it tells you in here, it tells you the name of the manuscripts behind the Greek. So whenever you read a Greek word, or okay, in the Bible, say, say you, you're reading 1 Corinthians 15, you look at your Greek interlinear, which will have the Greek, and you can find out if there are any textual variants, what manuscripts, and all the information is there for you. Lot. All right. So what it just does is, you're a Christian apologist, and you, you kind of like debate him, and say, right, well, 1 Corinthians 15, um, mm -hmm. So let, let's just do it. I'll pretend I'm the Christian apologist. So uh, so the Christian apologist brings 1 Corinthians 15, right? And says, uh, right, there's eyewitness evidence about Jesus. So this is the Christian apologist. I'm the Christian apologist. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have reached, received, and wherein you, you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the great part remain unto this present. But some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then also the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as born of Judah time. 
Now, uh, just I am a Christian apologist, but I'm just saying, like uh, the Christian apologist would say to Ijaz, this is early, this is an early creed that goes back to within a couple of years of Jesus's death and resurrection, even though people don't believe the resurrection. So Ijaz is saying, yeah, well, what manuscript are you quoting from? So like the Christian apologists have got like. So then, Ijaz, what Ijaz is doing is using this. In, in here is the Greek, we'll have the Greek of, of the 1 Corinthians, but it'll give you the manuscripts that it's based on. And it'll show you the textual variance. In other words, any other verses that are a bit different in any other manuscript will be noted in this book. This is what... And, and, and so you can see how the scholars put the text together for using other Greek manuscripts of 1 Corinthians. And Ijaz will say, but did you know that such a text has a textual variant? Okay. So, the Christian scholar will go, oh, oh, oh. Now, the point is, uh, just to answer Ijaz, uh, see, notice what, 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 what he doesn't understand is what Christian scholars actually, why they say it, because... The manuscript evidence uh, is irrelevant because there's, we have many manuscripts of 1 Corinthians. There might be some older, uh, but we have many manuscripts. Now, the, the point is, is that whatever manuscripts that we have, no manuscript would invent the word Cephas. That's an Aramaic construction. So scholars know that this could not have been written in the 2nd or 3rd century. This is 1st this is century literature. And it's an early source. And there is rabbinic method of passing on information. Where it says, uh, For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which we received. That's a rabbinic term. So they know that this goes, scholars know that this goes back early. So the idea that some second century or third century person interpolated this is ridiculous. So the, the point what I'm getting, that's not the point. I'm just defending that passage. That's not the point. The point that I'm trying to get at is this. Ijaz will try to challenge a Christian using textual criticism of the Bible. So if you see here, I have one, two, three, four different Greek um, interlinears, that means some of them have Greek and English underneath, some of them show you the manuscripts. Now, where's my Quran? Where's the Quran? Let me show you something. John, yeah, let me show you something. Here's your Quran. Did you know? That there's been the Cambridge Companion to the has been never been made a textual edition of the Quran. So we have nothing compared in the Muslim world to this. In other words, we have our manuscripts and we show you what the manuscripts are. So Ijaz uses our scholarship. When his own Muslim scholars will not do the scholarship on the Quran. You see the, the lie, the double lies, the double lies, the lying that Ijaz is doing, he's lying to you. He's using our scholarship on the Bible because we're honest with our manuscripts. But yet their scholars will not look at the textual Variants. There are textual variants. There are textual issues which I'm going to just show you quickly. So there are issues concerning uh, preservation in the earliest sources. Uh, there were disputes among Muslim scholars as to the Quran. Um, we have in Ibn Sa'd, 
Because of this, along with hundreds of other textual disagreement, Ibn Basud went so far as to call the final edition of the Quran deception. He said, the people have been guilty of deceit in reading of the Quran. I like it better to read according to the recitation, i.e. Muhammad, whom I love more than Zayed ibn Thabit, ibn Sayyid Kitab, al-Tabata, al-Kabar, volume 2, 44. So there were arguments amongst the, the Muslims about the text, the, the Quranic text. Sayyid Bukhari 505, Umar said, Obayim was the best of us in the recitation of the Quran, yet we leave some of what he recites. Obayim says, I have taken it from the mouth of Allah's messenger and will not leave it for anywhere else. So Masood says, due to these disputes among Muslims, hand-picked reciters Muslims are faced with a dilemma. If Muslims say that the Quran we have today has been perfectly preserved, they must conclude that Muhammad erred when he chose scholars. So even Muhammad's best reciters were debating which one had the, the Quran. There are missing chapters in the Quran. One of the Muhammad's companions, Abu Masu, supported Ibn Umar's claim by pointing out that the early Muslims forgot two entire surahs chapter of the Quran due to laziness. Sayyid Muslim 2286, Abu Masu al-Sharia, sent for the reciters of Basra, they came to him and they were the hundred in, were three hundred in number. They recited the Quran and he said, you are the best among the inhabitants of Basra, for you are the reciter to continue to recite, but bear in mind that your reciting for a long time may not harden your hearts, as were hardened the hearts of those before. He used to recite a surah which resembled in length and severity to Surah Barat. I have however forgotten it with the exception of this which I remember out of it. If there were two valley full of riches for the son of Adam, he would long for a third valley and nothing would fill the stomach of the son of Adam but dust. And we used to recite a surah which resembled one of the surahs of Musahabit and I have forgotten it. So here a whole chapter of the Quran was lost. Okay? So if you are doing, this is in, uh, has the Quran been perfectly preserved by uh, Stephen Masood? So the point, what I'm trying to get to you, is the bias. The textual criticism of the Bible. But no textual criticism of the Quran. And yet Ijaz wants to attack the Bible with textual criticism. But the Muslims will not do textual criticism on the Quran. They have verses missing, they have issues in the early sources that show that there was issues concerning the text of the Quran. Then we have um, then we have here uh, this is the Daniel Allen Brubaker corrections of the early Quran manuscripts. This is a, a non-Muslim source and he has shown An insertion in the top copy uh, erasure from the Metropolitan manuscript so top copy these are manuscripts of the Quran and he's shown many textual issues insertion in the word Allah In uh, multiple post-production, insertion of Allah, erasure in Marcel 2, Surah 30, verse 9, um, for erasures with insertion of color. So look, these are texts of ancient texts of the Quran where there have been insertions, things rubbed out, things put in, weren't there, etc. He's had to do it. It's not a Muslim that's done the textual issues of the Quran. It, it, it's a, a, a non-Muslim. But the Muslims won't do the textual criticism of the Quran. Um, this is uh, Samuel Green, Samuel Green's book article, and he has shown there's a, a variety of uh, Qurans there. You've got the Wash, you've got the Al Duri, the Kalaf, the Hafs, and then he has shown in there that there are textual variants in the words. Words that are different in different Quran manuscripts of the Arabic. 
No Muslims have done a textual edition of the Quran. So we see great bias going on and we have I'm trying to find it I can get it yeah so here is J Smith's paper this is J Smith's paper and J Smith's paper um, gives them some, uh, some interesting information these are manuscripts, the ancient manuscripts of the Quran. So there we are, the information there. Now in the top copy, Musafa, 22% of the Quran is missing. This is not Jay Smith saying it, this is Professor Dr. Ek Meldin, founding director of the Gen General of, Director General of IRCICA, a Secretary General of the Organization of an Islamic Conference Research Center. So this is Muslim scholar who J. Smith is quoting. And he says, we have none of Uthman's Musaf manuscripts. He says 22% of the Quran is missing. Then the Samark Quat manuscript, early mid-8th. Dr. Taylor al Tikulak. It is not Uthmik and dates for mid-8th. But... 60%, 66% of the Quran is missing. This is the ancient Qurans. Okay? The Al Hasun Cairo manuscript. Franco Duroc monumental MS are later than bigger than later. Paris Petropolitanus, early 8th. Francio Duroc, a great scholar on the Quran. 74% of the Quran is missing. So when they're making a Quran, Sana manuscript, bits of it missing, the top copy, bits of it missing, the Al Cairo manuscript, issues there about the dating, the Paris Metabolonus, bits missing of the Quran. When they're putting the Quran together, they're not telling you, like we tell you, what manuscripts they're using. There's no notes in here. So when Ijaz, the Muslim, is attacking the Bible and using textual criticism, we are honest about our text. We are honest about the text that we use in our textual criticism. The Muslims hide their scholarship because they don't want you to know that this has changed. <laughs> so there's a double standard. So when we're doing historical Jesus studies, Ijaz is not a historical Jesus scholar. Ijaz is trying to use textual criticism. He uses textual criticism to try and undermine what we're saying about Jesus' crucifixion. It's a double standard because when we look at him, there is no textual criticism going on in the Muslim world about the Quran. So it's not he's not consistent in his methodology. So I hope you've got that one. That's a very powerful argument against Ijaz. The double standard. And if, if I would have been on his show... And, and uh, Hamza, I would have brought, I would have brought that up. I would have brought that up. Okay, so that, so that is uh, the biased. We all have biased. Our biased. Uh, we believe the Bible is the word of God. That's a bias. They believe the Quran is the word of God. That's their bias. So we have to be honest about our bias. And, and, and at least try to bring. Uh, see if our bias are, are the best bias. So for example. If our bias is, is the Bible. The Old Testament for example. Our bias is, is a better bias. Because the Old Testament. The New Testament is rooted in that. Whereas the Quran is not rooted in any. Jewish source so we have to look at our bias and see if our bias are the better bias but then we have to be honest about our bias and then try to bring some common ground but here's the point they don't 
fairly debate. They're not fairly debating because they're not honest. They won't do textual criticism of the Quran. But yet they want to do textual criticism of the Bible and use it to attack what we say about Jesus. So they're biased. When they read the Quran, it informs their information. The hadiths inform them. And they won't do textual criticism on the Quran, but they will use our textual criticism on our Bible to attack it. All right? And they use as much as they can get and they try to attack us. But we're honest with our textual criticism. We don't hide things. Not like Uthman in the early source who burnt the Quranic sources. We don't hide them. We are honest about our sources. Okay. So now the next thing I want to uh, tackle is the double standards on history. Don't forget we're talking about the historical Jesus. Did Jesus die on a cross? Did Jesus die on a cross? For Christians, it's a very important thing. And the Muslim comes along and uses their bias. Uh, but for the Christian, that Jesus dying on a cross is very, 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 very important for us. Uh, so if we say that he didn't die on a cross, then it destroys Christianity. So do we have I've showed you Josephus I've showed you that there is evidence of Josephus I'll show you some more evidence in a minute it says in uh, in this hymn when I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt and all my pride forbid it Lord that I should boast save in the death of Christ my God all the vain things that charm me most I sacrifice to his blood. See, from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine that were an offering far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Jesus Christ died on that cross, he shed his blood. That is the Christian position. It says in um, Romans chapter 1. It says in Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I, am not a, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone to, who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And is written, the just shall live by faith. So we need to remember to trust in Christ that he shed his blood, that he died on that cross. And the just shall live by faith. You can only know God by faith in Christ. By trusting in Christ. It says in Psalm 2, kiss the son. You need to believe in Jesus and trust in him as your Lord and your Savior. And that is what we're defending tonight. And we're going to look more into this. But the point, the sec first point we made about Josephus' scholarship. They're wrong to dismiss Josephus. Second point, they're not admitting their bias. Their bias using the Quran, the Hadith, and uh, the theology. And also um, the textual criticism, lack of. They're not being honest about the lack of textual criticism about the Quran. Yet they're using our textual criticism to attack the Bible. Uh, the next issue that I want to bring up is the double standards as well. If you've got to be consistent. You've got to be consistent. They attack the Bible and they attack uh, that Jesus didn't die. When there's multiple evidence for that and early sources. Yet if you are to, if you are to read, I have here, I have here Islamic awareness. This is an, a Muslim site. And there is the, the about Mecca. So the Quran mentions Mecca, that Abraham went to Mecca. So if you go to your, your Quran, if you read um, Quranic 3, chapter 3, verse 96. 
It says, The first house to be built for mankind was the one at Baca, Maca, Mecca. It is blessed place, a source of guidance for the whole world. There are clear signs in it. It is the place where Abraham stood, and anyone who enters it will be secure. Pilgrimage to the house is a duty for God. So there you read it yourself. That the Quran says that Abraham went to the Kaaba in Mecca. Right? Here's the argument for that. They quote the evidence for Mecca existing of that time of Abraham. First they quote Gibbon, a 17th century historian, who doesn't give any evidence. Then they quote Ptolemy. Then they quote the Bible. And they quote Psalm, one of them is 84. And they say that that is the place of the Valley of Baca or Mecca. But just as they un underline, as they pass through the Valley of Baca, and they say Baca is Mecca in the Bible. As, they look, as we look at that, it says, verse 7, they go from strength to strength till each appear before in Zion. So the, the psalmist they're saying, if they're correct, is they go to Arabia, the Valley of Baca, Mecca, <laughs> and then they go to, to Jerusalem. Doesn't make sense. It, so they're obviously reading into the text. Word, itemology, word study, to prove uh, the history of something, you have to be very careful when you're doing that. You've got to be very, very careful in what you're doing. And they're just doing sophistry. The psalm is talking about somewhere in, in Israel. It's not talking about Mecca, all right? He's talking about going to Jerusalem. So that's their source. But here, here, oh, and just to prove Zion is about Jerusalem, uh, look at all these texts. These texts are all about Zion. And they're all referenced to Jerusalem. So I'm getting the psalm in its context. But look at this. This is uh, Dr. Rafa, Rafat Amari. And he goes through all the earliest sources. And when I mean go through all, I mean he goes the geographer of Alexander the Great and Arabia. Alexander sent three naval expeditions from Babylon. The first was under Archaeus who went as far as the island of Tylus and Ameria Abadas book. So, so it goes on and on and on. And he, he looks at Erastanes' survey. He looks at all the early historians before Christ who, tra who walked in the area of Mecca. And they don't mention Mecca. It was not a place... Until after Christ, sometime in the 2nd, 3rd, maybe 4th century. But it definitely was not a place, and there definitely was no Kaaba, three, 400 year, 300, 400 BC. This article by Dr. Rafat Amari, studies by classical writers show that Mecca could not have been built before the 4th century AD. And he looks at all the ancient historians and sources. Much, 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 ten times more scholarly than this Muslim source. So what do we learn from that? Well, when Ijaz and, uh, and um, Hamza start attacking the Bible, say it's not historical and what have you, uh, about Christ not dying on a cross when we have multiple early sources. The Quran, bit one of the Quran's biggest claims about Abraham going to Mecca at the Kaaba. This, the, this, the, the evidence is overwhelming that four centuries before Christ. And I'm trying to be generous here. I'm trying to be generous. There's nothing about Mecca. People who've walked in that area. Seeing the villages and towns, they do not mention Mecca of that time. 
and you see double standards they attack the Bible we got brilliant evidence in Josephus for example brilliant evidence in Tatters enemy attestation near the time of Jesus amazing testimony but yet their Quran has nothing to verify its historical claims when it talks about Mecca for example a major city today that wasn't before the Christ and yet it says it was you see the double standard if we ask for archaeological and evidence and sources they give us a quote from Gibbon a 17th century historian and they quote a psalm and quote Ptolemy and misquote him but they don't look at all the scholarship that was available prior to Christ they don't do proper historical scholarship you see they're just lies this is uh, Mansour's website and it's an absolute disgrace this article is a disgrace this is their proof that Mecca exists and yet they're trying to attack the crucifixion of Christ are they for real are they for real are they for real it's ridiculous and then we could go into the Quran is not the word of God and yet they believe the Bible uh, the Quran is the word of God and that is why they're looking at history uh, the Quran is not the word of God in Surah 434 it has wife beating Surah 3844 is backed up by their own traditions Sayyid Bukhari 72 715 husband beat he said he took her back submit to husband sexual desires uh, Muhammad struck Aisha Sayyid Muslim 42127 he struck me on the chest that caused me pain Sayyid Muslim 93506 Abu Kaba slaps women and Muhammad laughs Abu Dawe 2142 don't ask a beat wife in other words don't ask me just do it Sana Ibn Maju 39198 Don't ask a man why he beats his wife. Abu Dayud 2126 When pregnant woman has body, flog her. Ibn Ishaq 969 Separate room beaten lightly. Sheikh Yusef Al Quadra, one of the respectable clerics. Whereas it's necessary, so it's necessary, this is a modern scholar, it's necessary to beat your wife. Sheikh Dr. Ahmad Mohammed Al Tayek, head of Al Sunni, Islam's most prestigious institution, light beating, punching to reform wife. So the Quran is not the word of God when. Their teaching is that you can beat a wife from this Quran. There are contradictions in the Quran. Um, Surah 96.2 From sounding clay and from mud. So what was man created? Man out of mere clot of congealed blood. Surah 96.2 We created man from sounding clay. So one minute is blood, one minute is clay. From mud molded into shape. Surah 15, 26. The multitude of Jesus before Allah is that of Adam. He created him from dust, then said to him, Be, and he was. Surah 3, 59. But does not man call to mind, We created him before out of nothing. So it's clot of blood, clay, out of nothing, out of dust. He has created man from a sperm drop. Behold, this man, same man became an open Disputer, 16.4, so sperm, dust, nothing, blood, clay. How was it created? How was man created? The Quran is full of contradictions. That's one example. So they're using the Quran as their way of doing history. When they're looking at the Bible, when they're looking at history, that is, they believe this is the Word of God, and it's not the Word of God. They believe it's been preserved... Muhammad couldn't remember his Quran. Sari Bukhari, Volume 6, 
book 61 5 1 13 muhammad requested seven different ways seven versions so they were even in his time they were mixed up about the quran bukhari volume 6 61 509 muhammad never authorized the collection of the quran and Sayyid Bukhari, volume 6, 61, 559, Muhammad forgot a verse. Even Muhammad couldn't remember. He didn't authorize the Quran to be. He's got no so called divine authority for a collection. He's got in historical inquiry. Okay, that's Islam's uh, foundation. That's the foundation done. That's how they use history. They use the Quran. They, they claim that they have history and I've shown, I've debunked that, I've shown you that that's a load of nonsense. Okay, so next. Early historical sources, uh, J.B. Lightfoot, the apostle uh, is a, a Sorry, I went to get some water. <clears throat> but now we're going to go into more evidence about the historical Jesus. And uh, we will come back to the Quran later. And uh, some more. Just needed some water. So. So this is uh, J.B. Lightfoot, the Apostle Father, Apostolic Fathers, and uh, he has a collection of the letters of uh, the epistles of Ignatius. So Ignatius is coming off the uh, first into the early second century A.D. And in, in, in here he gives manuscript evidence, there's manuscript evidence for the books because uh, it just likes manuscripts so the manuscripts are in their reference there um, and he references that he referenced the scholarship on page 57 so he gives you the Greek manuscripts there okay and when they were found now Ignatius on page 65 of this book So in, in verse 9, in the book, in, in his letter to the Ephesians, he says, But I have learned that certain persons pass through you, etc. Um, he says, Of Jesus Christ, which is the cross, and using for a rope the Holy Spirit, while your faith is your windlass. But if you read... Ignatius letters there's a lot that he talks about about Christ death in Ignatius so Ignatius is an early source of the death of Christ you know so read the letters of Ignatius in fact I can give you uh, references of also um,
trying to find uh, the information. But if you read Ignatius' letters, trying to find, trying to find it. Sorry about this. Ignatius is the case in point. He lived from 35 to 117 AD. Scholars debate about the exact date. He was most definitely active in the later end of the first century. He quoted the Gospels. Jesus Christ was the stock of David. He was from Mary. He was truly born, ate, drank, and was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died, and also was truly raised from the dead, his father raising him. Ignatius based his comments on the Gospels. He knows at least three Gospels, Matthew, Luke and John, and uses them often even in his letters. Ignatius' letter to the Tralians, 9.4, J. and N. Kelly, Early J. N. D. Kelly, Early Christian Creeds, London, Longman, uh, 1963, page 68. Quotes Matthew 12.23, his letter to the Ephesians 4.2, Luke 24.39, in his letter Smyrians, 3, 2, John 3, 8 in his letter uh, to Philadelphia 7, 1. Also noted in page 28 of the Gospel of Truth, Paul Barnett, IVP 2012, Ignatius wrote about 110 AD, so it puts the Gospels at first century historical source. So not only does Ignatius testify to the death of Christ, he also testifies to the Gospels who wrote them and the source of the Gospels putting the Gospels in the early 1st century. And uh, we can give other sources. Uh, scholars, we have uh, the Gospels can be traced as historical source material. Tatian, a Syrian Christian theologian, lived about 120-180. His text, Diatosron, is a harmony of the four Gospels. The text was used by Syriac-speaking churches and was standard text for the end of that time. That was 180 AD. 150 AD. Just in Martyr First Apology, 150 quotes the Gospel of John, chapter 3, in 1 Apollos 61 4 5, 130. But he attests to the Gospels, he attests. There we are. That the Gospels are early sources. This is the Nicene Creed. This has got Just in Martyr in it. There. Okay. Um, Eusebius did, so this is about the early sources to the death of Christ, about the Gospels. Eusebius, the historian, says that Papias talks about the writings of Matthew Mark when Papias wrote his five volume exposition of the oracles in 130. This is backed up by the Rylands Papyri that contains fragments of John's Gospel dating to 130. This means the Gospel of John was much earlier, 120 AD. Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John in his letter to Philippi, for the Philippian church, he quotes from the Gospel and other New Testament books, 100 AD. Uh, the Dedicate, so that was 120, Polycarp, 100 AD. The Dedicate was a teaching text used widely by the church. The writer quotes from Matthew on the Lord's Supper. So why the Lord's Supper? It's not about the death of Christ, but it backs up that the Gospels were early sourced because it's quoting Matthew. And then Clement quotes Matthew 1, uh, Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. So the Gospels are first century documents. We have many scholars that bear this up. John Wayneham, professor of New Testament Greek, a biblical scholar. Uh, Berger Gerritsen, Swedish professor at Lund University. Marcel Jaus, a French Bible scholar. Jean uh, Karmenka, French scholar. Philip Roland, a French scholar. Uh, Carson, Peace to Thede, German papyriologist, etc. So many, many scholars would agree that the Gospels are early source material. We can... Uh, we have some manuscript early sources. We have P52, 
second century there's a verse of John 8 from 18 P67 125 to 150 AD a few verses from Matthew 3 5 P64 125 to 150 AD a few verses from Matthew 26 uh, P4 125 to 150 AD portion of Luke chapter 1 2 3 and 4 P75 175 AD portion of Luke chapter 3 4 5 6 7 9 17 22 P77 17 to 200 a few verses of Matthew 23 P103 uh, date 175 to 200 AD a few verses from Matthew 13 14 P104 uh, 175 to 200 AD a few verses from Matthew 21 P90 uh, 175 to 200 AD a portion of John 18 19 P1 200 a portion of Matthew 1 200 uh, P1 is 200 AD portion of Matthew chapter 1 P46 200 AD most of John P45 early 3rd century portions of the Gospels and Acts so here these are just some manuscripts uh, attributing that the Gospels were in circulation in the first century. The fact that these are bits of the, the manuscript showing you that these, these Gospels that we have are first century. Showing you that they were well able to be eyewitness material. And... Uh, Even the Gospel of Thomas, uh, a Gnostic Gospel, which we'll get to the Gnostic Gospels in a minute. Uh, in 24, uh, it, it, the Gospel of Thomas in 69 uh, is, is quoting from Matthew 5.10. Uh, and there are many, I, I could give you another example, Matthew chapter 5 verse 14, Gospel of Thomas quotes 32. So the Gospel of Thomas that I don't regard as a historical book, but some scholars are saying it's it near the first century is quoting from Matthew he quotes from Luke in Luke chapter 11 27 28 Thomas the gospel of Thomas is quoting in verse 79 in John chapter 1 verse 9 gospel of Thomas quotes in 24 in other words a, a Gnostic gospel that's not very historical that scholars say is in the first century or near the first century is quoting Matthew Luke and John Showing you that the Gospels are early sources for history, for the life of Jesus. You can't get better than that. Now, Ijaz uses this weird argument. Uh, and he uses a weird argument. And he, he shows a graph. And the graph is that we have a few manuscripts that are early in the 2nd century. And then when we get to the 10th century, the graph is like that. And he says, look how poor it is. But this kind of evidence, historians would go mad for. If they could get this kind of early source about, about the manuscripts that are going to be testifying about Jesus, it, 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 they would be just so amazed. They would be so amazed. Oh, so, for example... We have 5,000 copies of the New Testament or more, and then thousands of copies of, of Latin. For Caesar's book on history, uh, we have, a hundred, uh, it was written 100 to 44 BC. Earliest copy is 900 AD. That's at least 900 years after and no a thousand years and we have about 10 copies so we have bits of manuscript not 900 or a thousand years but within 80 90 years 150 years 200 years this is good compared to ancient history yet secular historians they're not going to doubt about the life of caesar so we, 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 this skepticism that hijab is using is not, is not what, uh, is not fair because when you compare it with other sources, so 
this is a, a good article, it's an excellent article. So, and then there's lots of um, uh, this article is by uh, J.P. Moreland it's called The Histrosity of the New Testament by J.P. Morland, and it's a very good article, J.P. Morland. And uh, he goes, he goes, eyewitnesses, it would seem that a strong case could be made for the fact that much of the New Testament, including the Gospels, are the sources behind them, was written by eyewitnesses. This method explicitly in a number of places, Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and 4, so let's look at that one. Luke chapter 1 Luke chapter 1 1 to 4 Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us so the Greek word for eyewitness there is the word that Polybius used as a Greek historian a couple of hundred years before Luke. And Polybius said you need eyewitness to do history. So Luke is wanting to do eyewitness history, get and gather eyewitness material. So the New Testament was concerned about eyewitness. We see that in what 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, Galatians chapter 1, and Acts chapter 2 verse 22. Finally, there is an in, in, indirect testimony to eyewitness evidence in the gospel. For example, if a number of pronouns in Mark, see Mark chapter 1, 21, 29, the person plural, they, to the first person plural, we, they can easily be seen as, as eyewitness reminiscence of Peter, who gave Mark such, uh, so much of the material of the gospel. So, where is that? Just trying to think where it is. Ah, here it is. So that's... Is that it? Just trying to think where it is. Got some source somewhere. Where is it? Oh, can't find it, can't find it. But if you read, um, I'm sure it's in here. Is it in here? I had, uh, I've got so many sources around. So, so if you read uh, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, and you read Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon, and read his Peter's sermons, you'll see the style of Mark is the same as the style of Peter's sermons. And it shows you that Mark is using uh, Peter's, um, Peter's eyewitness. And we'll, we'll get to that. Arguments supporting eyewitness influence. Several reasons can be offered for trusting these claims. First, as Goldsack reminds us, a document should be assured trustworthy unless under burden of proof is shown to be unreliable. As Immanuel Kant, Immanuel Kant showed long ago, a general presumption of lying is self-refuting, since if such presumption is universalised, one always assumes someone is lying. Lying becomes pointless 
lying is impossible without a general presumption of truth telling. So if you're always thinking that a manuscript is dubious, it's always going to be dubious. You've got to just be, uh, when you're looking at an ancient manuscript, just to give it a bit of credence before you start to reject it. Second, such a presumption of truth telling is especially strong if the witness passes these tests. He is able to tell the truth, he is willing to do so, he is accurately reported, and there are external corroboration of his testimony. And you can find that with the New Testament. The New Testament, they're honest people. I could give uh, many. So J.P. Moreland's article is very, very helpful. Uh, please get hold of that. You'll find that a real help. I think, uh, just see if it's in here. It's not in there. J.P. Moreland's article on the historicity of the New Testament is an excellent, excellent uh, piece of, of work. So, uh, this eye, the, the New Testament was wanting to get eyewitnesses. We looked at that in Luke, for example, and just talked about Mark is using Peter, and you can check the style if you go and read them. So I'll put that there. Just before we, just before we get into uh, more of the defence of the, the uh, cross, defence of Jesus, um, uh, books on the cross. R.C. Sproul, the Unexpected Jesus, published by Christian Focus, is a very good book. This is a really good book on Jesus, and it talks about his death. Very, very good. The Death of Christ by James Denny is an excellent work. Uh, it's an old work, but it talks about the theology of the cross. Very, very good to read. Uh, this is a classic. Um, John Stott did deviate on the doctrine of hell, but it doesn't affect this book. This book is an excellent book on the theology of the cross. You can get it for free PDF. The Scots, John Stott, The Cross of Christ, is a brilliant book on the atonement. If you want to study about why Jesus died, this is an excellent book to study. And then a classic, The Apostolic Preaching of the Cross by Leon Morris, is an excellent book you'll find uh, very, very good. You'll, you'll, you'll be blessed by that. The Apostolic Preaching of the Cross by Leon Morris, published by Tyndale. So those are books that you can read. Uh, the Theology of the Atonement, a very good article to read about why Christ died, is Simon Gathaskol. This is excellent because the cross is attacked not only by Muslims, but even evangelicals don't believe Jesus was punished for our sin. The Cross and the Substitutionary Atonement by Simon Gatherskull. So there we are. That's his name. That's an excellent article that I would encourage you to get hold of. The Atonement Under Fire by Don Carson is a good article to read. The Atonement Under Fire by Don Carson is a good article to read on the theology of the cross. And then the scriptural necessity of Christ's penal substitution by Richard L. Mayhew from Master Seminary is an excellent article on why Christ died. And then 
S. Lewis Johnson, The Last Supper and the Lord's Supper and the New Covenant. And this is an excellent article looking at the Lord's Supper and how it's in reference to the death of Christ. And it's a very good article looking at the Jewish and biblical background of Jesus' death. So there. A good, helpful survey of the New Testament when you want to study manuscript evidence of the Gospels, uh, a seminary uh, text is a new introduction to the New Testament by Leon Morris. If you're debating Muslims, these kind of books are helpful to know. Uh, but this gives you the manuscript evidence and tradition evidence for the Gospels and other books of the New Testament. What the scholars say and everything. Don Carson, Douglas Moo, Leon Morris, An Introduction to the New Testament. Very, very helpful book published by Opolos. Apollos. Uh, a, a good old book is New Testament Survey by Merrill T. Tenney by IVF. I, IVF. It's an old book. You can get it second hand. Get all of it. This is good about uh, the New Testament and what it's all about. Okay. So it's very, very good. Okay, also, um, this is a very good book, popular work. If you want to find out information about the cross and did Jesus die, A Case for Christ by Lee Strubble. Lee Strubble. And there's an interview there of an archaeologist. Um, this is... Um, an interview of uh, John McRae, PhD. When scholars and students study archaeology, many turn to John McRae's third dispassionate 432 page textbook. Yeah. Okay, I think it'll be over now. But I'm going to. Just continue because I've got good internet now. I'll, I'll, I'll do another half an hour and then I'll finish. Okay. It's just my wife saying, uh, giving me some advice. So he, he studied at Hebrew. This is uh, McRae's, uh, an archaeologist. He studied Hebrew uni he, at Hebrew University. And he's got all sorts of PhDs. And he gives a good interview about Luke's accuracy here. And he says... The physician and historian Luke authored both the Gospel bearing his name and the Book of Acts, which together constitute about one quarter of the entire New Testament. Consequently, a critical issue, whether Luke was a historian who could be trusted to get things right. When archaeologists check out the details of what he wrote, I said, do they find that he was a careful or sloppy? He says, the scholar, the general consensus of both liberal and conservative scholars is that Luke is very accurate as a historian. McRae replied. So McRae, a scholar, an archaeologist, is saying that Luke is a accurate historian. So get the book, it's very, very helpful. Okay, so we're getting into a bit more of our evidence. I'm just going to have a break for a minute. Sorry. So, we've looked at, so where, where have we got to so far? So I'm just going to remind you. Um, so, uh, Hamza and Ijaz dismissed this out of hand. I, so I've shown categorically you can't dismiss them. And I focused on Josephus scholarship and give you some good pointers on that. Secondly, we went to the Quran, to the Hadiths uh, scholarship and showed you that they have a Quranic verse that says Jesus didn't die. The Hadiths scholarship that they don't tell you about. That is, these are biased history. So we looked at how biased they are in the historical inquiry and how they do not tell us about this biased. All right. Then we looked at Ijaz's issue when he attacks the Bible 
so he'll, he'll attack Jesus didn't die and he'll use textual criticism and I showed you that when we compare the Christian textual criticism we're honest we give our his, our texts of our manuscripts and in the Quran they don't so Ijaz is, is just not being honest he's just using double standards then we looked at uh, Ignatius and I give you this book because it gives you the manuscript evidence if you want to check it because Ijaz likes to check the manuscript evidence but here, here uh, Ignatius talks about the death of Christ so this is a, a first late first century source about the death of Christ we've talked about uh, the bi uh, the biased I'm oh, sorry we talked about uh, what else did we talk about uh, about eyewitnesses that Luke wants to use eyewitness material uh, and w oh, sorry we, we showed evidence that in the manuscript tradition from Diatataron just in Marta and the quotes of the gospel shows you that as we go down and down the line, the Didache and all these early sources even show us that the Gospels are early historical. Quote them, and then I showed you scholars that agree with that. But then I went on to show you uh, manuscript evidence, uh, various PPP manuscripts that root the Gospels in the first century, because these manuscripts are in the early second century which shows you that they were copied and they would have been come from the first century. So I've given you uh, manuscript evidence of the Gospels to show you that they're early first century. Uh, and so that's where we've got to so far. Showing you that when we talk about Jesus and that he was crucified, we have a lot of early evidence. The Gospels are eyewitness, the first century. We have the early church father, we have Josephus. We have a multiplicity of evidence all over the place. So anybody denies it, and, and we show the historical bias in, uh, by Muslims when we look at their historiography, say on Mecca, there's no archaeological evidence, there's, no, there's nothing to back up uh, what they're saying about Mecca, and yet they're trying to critique our belief that Jesus didn't die on a cross, and it's ridiculous. So we, we've shown them to, to, to fail there. So now, uh, some more arguments. All this stuff I've prepared for Ijaz. Um, but, uh, so, so we, we read in Surah 4157 and 158. So now I want to get to some more, more uh, scholarship now. In, in, in the proof of Jesus and we also uh, just we also looked at a Gnostic gospel that actually quotes the four gospels showing you that the four gospels are first century um, so we we have sort of 4157 158 that denies that Christ was crucified now if you read Irenaeus against the heresies book 1 chapter 24 40 so, sorry, I, I want to just camp on this a minute, just for a minute. In Surah 4, 157, 158, it's crucified, right? But in other translations of the Quran, Muslim scholars have put in that someone else was put in his place. So, for example, uh, the Al Khan translation says, And because of their saying in boast, we killed Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, and Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. But the resemblance of Isa, Jesus, was put over another man. And they killed that man. Now that's an interpolation. That's them putting that in. So we have two translations of the Quran. One says, Jesus did not die. But it seems so. One says, someone was put in his place. So which one? In Irenaeus against his er against heresies book 1 chapter 24 he says he did not himself suffer death but Simon a certain man of Cyrene 
being compelled bore the cross in his stead. So this is Irenaeus quoting Basilides, who was a Gnostic, who said Jesus was not crucified, but Simon was put in his place. So what I'm saying is, this is a Gnostic source. A Gnostics didn't believe that Jesus had a physical body, for example, many of them. They believed in weird ideas about God. They didn't believe uh, in, in any Christian or Jewish God or anything, or in, in the Christian, Judo-Christian God. So this is a Gnostic source that Irenaeus is quoting, a Christian. Now this is what's behind the Quran. So the Quran is a Gnostic source. The Quran is quoting from sources that are not historical. When the Quran says Jesus did not die, it's getting its sources from non-historical sources. So the second treatise of Seth was not afflicted at all, yet not die in solid reality, but in what appears. The second treatise of Great Seth again, another, their father was the one who drank the gall of the vinegar. It was not I. Another document, Nag Hammami recounts, I saw him, Jesus, seemingly being seized by them, and I said, what do I see? This is the Coptic Apocalypse of Peter, which says Jesus did not die. But it seemed like it. The Quran has taken Gnostic sources that are not historical. So the Quran uh, is a Gnostic book. And uh, more proof of that is in Quran Surah 3, 35, 37. This is not on the death of Christ, but on a different source. But just showing you a different issue, but showing you how the Quran really is just copied off these Gnostic Gospels that are late 2nd second, second century at least. They're not 1st century, but 2nd century. They're not historical. They're not, they're not based on any eyewitnesses or anything. They're based on various philosoph Eastern, Middle East, Near Eastern philosophies and Greek philosophy. In Quran, Surah 3, 35, 37, it says, Behold, a woman of Imram said, O my Lord, I do dedicate unto thee what is my womb for thy special service, so accept this of me, for thou nearest and knowest all things. And this is uh, taken from the Proto-Evangelion, Evangel Evangelion, the lost book of the Bible, uh, is quoted by the Quran in Surah 19, 22, 26. So we, she conceived, this is the Quran, so she conceived him, Jesus, and she retired with him to a remote place. The lost book of the Bible says, Now on the third day after Mary was wearied in the desert by the heat, she asked Joseph to rest for a little while under the shame of a palm tree. So you can see that the Quran is taken from books that are not historical. The infancy gospel of Jesus. Jesus spoke even when he was in the cradle. This is a, a Gnostic gospel. The Quran, Surah 19, 29-23. But she pointed to the babe. They said, how can we talk to one who is a child? In the cradle he said, I am indeed a servant of Allah. So you can see the Quran is borrowing its sources from from um, from Gnostic Gospels, and people like Hamza and uh, will will be happy to believe in the Gospel of Barnabas, which is known to be a, a, a third century, thirteenth century. Uh, Middle Ages written by someone in Spain because it has Spanish words uh, from the Middle Ages. So even Muslims will believe the Gnostic Gospels that are not historical, yet they won't believe the four Gospels. So Richard Balcom, uh, a major scholar, points out a distinction between the New Testament Gospels and the most of the Gnostic Gnostic Gospels, while rather obvious when one reads the Gnostic Gospels, is frequently overlooked. So, Balcom, a very high 
empowered scholar says, the New Testament Gospels are biographical, biographical narratives where most of the Gnostic Gospels are post-resurrection revelations. These are the using, by the way. Typically, in Gnostic Gospels, Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection. Darren Meyer. Thank you, Darren. But my, my internet, Darren, is not working, brother, on, on your thing. I'll try to come on, but... Well, I can't really. I'm, I'm in the full flow now. So thank you. Darren Mayer. Thank you so much, Darren. I really appreciate it. My internet seems to be working for Facebook. It's not working for YouTube. I've tried YouTube. Uh, and it's not... Um... Okay, I'll try and get my internet sorted there, but it, it's very difficult. But it, it's... it's um... The um, the issue is, for some reason, when I try and go on your stream and YouTube, it's not going together. Then I've tried to go on my own on YouTube, it's not been very good. But Facebook seems to be working fine. So, But thank you, uh, Darren, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. If I can get, I'll let you know, if I can get my internet sorted properly, um... I'll let you know a few days in advance whether I can come on. Okay, but thank you, Darren. I really appreciate that for your courtesy. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you. So, Richard Balcom, but uh, you can watch this video and answer some of these, Darren, in your show, because this is what I would have brought to you. Uh, Richard Balcom says, so thank you very much, Darren. God bless you and, and bless to your team, to Ijaz and Hamza. I'm doing this in love uh, and respect, but I'm trying to do it in a very robust scholarly way. So if I'm quite strong, it's that. But God bless you. Well, Richard Balcom says the New Testament Gospels are by the Gnostic Gospels are post-resurrection revelations. Typically, Gnostic Gospels, Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection. And either in a dis discussion with a group of disciples. Okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, okay, Hamza. <laughs> okay, Hamza. God bless you. Thank you for your invitation, Hamza. Much appreciated. Um, I I've tried to get on your show, but it's not working. The I've gone on YouTube on my own. It's not working. But for some reason, it's working on Facebook. So all that I would have said to you, Hamza. And it has, this is the video. Okay, I'll show you. Hamza. Greek. Greek. This is the stuff that I would have given you. But I'm giving it here on this stream. Uh, probably give some tomorrow. So thank you, Hamza. Love to your family. Love to Ijaz and his family. Love to you all. God bless you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. I'll let you. I'll try and let you a day or two before, um, if I can get internet. But it's so difficult in in Ghana. Okay, take care, bro. Uh, so, Richard Balcom on the Gnostic Gospels. The New Testament Gospels are biographical narratives where most of the Gnostic Gospels are post-resurrection revelations. Typically, in Gnostic Gospels, Jesus appears to the disciples after the resurrection and either in a discussion with a group of disciples or in special revelation to one especially favoured disciples imparts knowledge of the true nature of the world and salvation a message that is characteristically depicted as an esoteric revelation not given to Jesus' public teaching during his ministry but reserved for the elect few to whom he entrusted afterwards that form of gospel, the post-resurrection narrative actually presupposes that there are well-known accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus before his resurrection. Readers of these texts are certainly expected already to have some idea who Jesus and his disciples are. Some of these Gospels do not even name Jesus, but speak of him simply as the Saviour of or the Lord. But more than that, the fact that they position themselves after the resurrection itself presupposes, presupposes that the definite, definite, definite accounts of Jesus' teaching 
During his ministry are well known. The purpose of the Gnostic Gospels is to add. So the Gnostic Gospels are post-resurrection. In other words, they're, they're reflecting after the facts. And they are not historical. They just have these teachings and there's nothing historical around them. And like I've done, I've done studies where I've shown you that the the Jesus um, that the the, the 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 four gospels mention at least seventy times Jerusalem. Get the places right in Jerusalem. The Gnostic gospels mention Jerusalem very rarely. They don't know the places of Jerusalem. So it's obviously the late second century sources. And Richard Balcom is making that point. Yet the Quran uses these sources. Again, uh, verses on the issue of eyewitnesses. John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. All I'm doing here is showing you that there was an interest in eyewitnesses, the, the importance of eyewitness. Eyewitness authority was commissioned by Jesus. Luke chapter 24, 4, 44, 49. Now he said to them, there are... These are my words which I spoke to you while I was in all things which are written about me and in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. The repentance of, uh, of forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold I am sending forth to promise of my father. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power and high. So Jesus is saying that it's important that you be a witness. Acts chapter 1, 6 and 8. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, uh, as it is at this time, you are restoring the kingdom of Israel. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem. So there was a, an interest in being eyewitnesses. We see that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elders and witnesses of the sufferings of Christ, and of the partakers also of the glory that is to be revealed. 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 and 17. For we did not follow cleverly devised t tales when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 and 3. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen from our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifest and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the, the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. John chapter 21, 24, 25. This is the disciple who is testifying of these things and wrote these things. When we know that, that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did. Which if they were written in, in detail. I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books written. And then you can read. You can read many other uh, texts. But verse 24. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And there are many texts more I could give there. But what I'm saying is. There was an interest in eyewitnesses. There was an interest in eyewitness material. Whether you agree with it or not is another question, but there was, a, there was an interest in eyewitness material. Um, this eyewitness material had connections or, or could be traced back. So we know that John taught Ignatius, Papius and Polycarp. Ignatius was 3117 called himself Theophorus, which means the God-bearer. Church tradition describes Ignatius as one of the children that was Jesus' blessing of John, eventually became bishop at Antioch. So John taught Ignatius. Papius 6154 was described by Irenaeus as a hero of John, a companion of Polycarp, a man of all time. He eventually became the bishop Areopolis. He was quite familiar with the oral testimony and the eyewitnesses of the documentation of their gospel accounts. 
So Papias was connected to, to John. Polycarp, 69.155 AD, was a friend of Ignatian and a student of John. So we have Papias, we have Ignatius, Papias and Polycarp close to the tradition of Jesus, passing on the tradition that Jesus died and rose again. So this is not only early source, but it can be traced to be reliable eyewitnesses. Then the Gospels. The Gospels again, um, oh I could go into so much information on the canon, the quote, I think I've done enough, I think I've, I could go on and on and on, <laughs> but I'll just show you my, my information. I think uh, I'll try and answer a few other issues that have come up. But just to say that Irenaeus quotes uh, 185 affirmed 27 four of the book 24 of the books of the New Testament. He lived from 185 AD, and uh, so that means uh, he was in France. Just note that he was in France, Italy, Hippolytus. Uh, you can get it on. Uh, Cold Case Christianity. You can get a lot of this information, Anthony, on Cold Case Christianity. Cold Case Christianity, John Wallace. So, the gospel were, quote, were, were known as gospels in France by Irenaeus 185. The gospels were known in Italy, Hippolytus 220 AD, quotes the four gospels. In Egypt, Origen 225 AD affirmed many of the 27 books, but the four gospels. And in Palestine, Eusebius... 324 AD, firm 26, and those four of them were the Gospels. So, the Gospels are used early on in the 2nd century uh, in France, Irenaeus. 2nd century in Italy by Apollitus. 2nd century by Origen in Egypt. What shows you is the Gospels, four Gospels, were known all over the ancient world as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Showing you that it was accurately passed on. When you look at the quotations of the early church fathers and other ancient sources, uh, these are the, a map of their quotations. So they're quoted by ancient sources. Polycarp, Ignatius, there is Polycarp, Ignatius, Marcion. Uh, they're often quoted. When you, when you look, the Gnostic Gospels, they're not quoted by any ancient sources. Okay? Polycarp of Samaria, 110 AD, one letter with 100 qu uh, quotation as allusion to Christian writings. So there are quotations of. Sorry, sorry. We could go into Ignatius, Polycarp, Marcion, Valentius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement, Clement Tertullian. Maritorian frag fragment, Origen, Eusebius, Codex Sinaiticus, Athanasius, Didymus the Blind, and uh, the Vulgate. These show us many quotations and many, many, many manuscripts showing the, the tenacity of the text, what we call the tenacity of the text. If you go into many, many, many more on that Peter J. Williams the historical reliability of Mark's gospel the historical reliability of Mark's gospel it was not 
for Mark's Gospel, Mark would be a very minor figure indeed in the beginning of Christianity. He's certainly not someone you would ascribe Mark's Gospel in order to give it more authority. If, if Mark is not a genuine Gospel, why would they use Mark? You know, the Gnostic Gospels, they try to be grandiose, the, the epistle of the, Apoc the epistle of Peter or they try to give themselves grandiose names but with the gospel of Mark it shows you the name itself is authentic the range of language in Mark the Mark's gospel is written in Greek yet its language fits well with the idea that it was written in Rome the Latin word speculator is used for the executioner and the Latin word centuria occurs rather than the Greek word for centurion so this shows that the tradition is that Mark wrote the gospel in Italy and this backs up that it was Mark. There are no attempts to cover up embarrassments. Um, through the Gospel it makes extraordinary claims about Jesus' miraculous activities. It seems to make no attempt to cover up the failures of the early Christian leaders. The disciples are said to misunderstand in Mark chapter 8. argue who is the greatest in Mark 9.34, get angry with two of the leading disciples and ultimately abandon Jesus in Mark 14.50. The leading disciple Peter denied Jesus three times in Mark 14.66-72. So these are indications, these are in indications of the authenticity of the Gospel of Mark. It's showing you the embarrassing bits about Peter, etc. The lack of embellishment. The gospel is written in a simple, straightforward style. Even when the miraculous events are reported, it shows you that there that this is no ordinary gospel. This is a uh, hallmark of the teacher. Mark contains three major sections of the teaching by Jesus, chapter four, seven, and thirteen, as well as shorter accounts of teaching. Various features of what is attributed to Jesus suggest that Jesus' teaching were not invented by Christians. since they use forms of speech and expressions either not found or rarely attested among early Christians and they do not show many of the features of early Christian discourse. So there were issues that Christians were debating in the second century but it's, they're not read into the Gospel of Mark showing you that the Gospel of Mark is first century Manuscript evidence of the Gospel of Mark. The manuscript evidence of the Gospel of Mark is far better than the most classical works, even though there are fewer early copies of Mark's Gospel than of the other Gospels, Matthew, Luke and John. The early extensive copy, copy of Mark's Gospel is probably the manuscript of the four Gospels known as P45 and held in Dublin, generally dated from AD 225. So there's manuscript evidence to show that the Gospel of Mark is first century because we have a copy in the second century but we've looked at that before so showing you that the gospel of mark is early historical source material about jesus this is a uh, many many verses about jesus is the son of god um i'll just quote some matthew 4 3 matthew 4 6 matthew 14 33 Matthew 26:63, Matthew 27:40, Matthew 27:43, uh, Matthew 27:54, Mark chapter 1 verse 1, Mark chapter 3 verse 11, Mark chapter 15:39, Luke chapter 1:35, Luke 4:3, Luke 4:9. Why am I saying this? Because the argument that Hamza makes is it could have been someone else. It could have been someone else who died on the cross. All right, but how could it be that the writing specifically? Here are scriptures about him being the son of God. They're not going to make a mistake about him saying he died when they're saying he's the son of God. Luke chapter 4, 41. Luke chapter 8, 28. Luke 22, 70. John chapter 1, 34. John chapter 1, 49. John chapter 5, 25. John chapter 9, 35. John chapter 11, verse 4. John chapter 11, 27. John chapter 19, 7. John chapter 20, 31. Acts chapter 8, 37. Acts chapter 9, 20. And we could go on and on. The historical reliability of the 49 historical confirmed facts of the Gospel of John uh, by Craig Bloomer. 
1459 historical facts of the Gospel of John. For example, archaeology confirms the proper place of Jacob's wealth. Confirming the Gospel of John. And there are 49 that confirm the historicity of the Gospel of John. 84 confirmed facts of the last chapter of the book of Acts. 16, 84 confirmed facts in the last 16 chapters of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, the setting of Hellenistic history, the late classic scholar Colin Hermer identified 84 facts in the last 16 chapters of the book. So this is a classical scholar, not a Christian, who verified 84 facts of the book of Acts as being historically reliable. One is the natural crossing between correctly named ports in Acts chapter 13, verse 3 and 5. So when we're reading about the life of Jesus and his history, did he die? The book of Acts is a good historical material. The accuracy of the book of Acts. Sir William Ramsey, 1851, 1939, a British scholar initially questioned the historicity of Acts, but after years of literally digging up the evidence in archaeological explorations, Ramsey became convinced that Acts was so remarkably accurate in detail that the whole of it must be considered trustworthy. This is Sir William Ramsey, 1851-1939, a skeptic about Acts. He wrote, I had read a good deal of modern criticism about the book and duly accepted the current opinion that it was written during the second half of the second century by an author who wished to influence the minds of people in his own time by a highly wrought and imaginative description of the early church. His object was not to present a trustworthy picture of the facts in the period about AD 50, but to produce a certain effect on his own time by setting forth a carefully coloured account of events and persons of that older period. He wrote for his commentaries and truth. After much investigation, Ramsey wrote, Ramsey wrote this. He was a sceptic of Luke, but he went to Israel to study about the archaeology, and this is what Ramsey wrote. The present writer takes the view that Luke's history, Luke's history, is unsurpassed in respect to its trustworthiness. At this point, we are describing what reasons and arguments and changed the mind of one began under the impression that history was written long after the events and that it was untrustworthy as a whole. In other words, Ramsey is saying, look, this is... Luke is amazing historian. J.B. Lightfoot, one of the greatest scholars of his day, fluent in seven languages, he made vast contributions to the literature of the New Testament. In one of his works defending the supernatural character of the New Testament, he said of the book of Acts, No ancient work affords so many tests of veracity, for no other has such numerous points of contact in all directions with contemporary history, politics and topography, whether Jewish or Roman. Essays of the work entitled Supernatural Religion, page 1920. So, Ramsey a skeptic. Ramsey a skeptic. Ramsey a skeptic. Ramsey a skeptic became a believer in Luke as a historian, said he was a, a, a superb historian. One of the issues that Hamza and um, Hamza and uh, Ijaz bring up is the resurrection narrative where there are people coming out of the tombs. Well, in his book, Bart Ehrman, in his book, The Triumph of Christianity, writes about how did Christianity... Uh, move forward because all the other messianic views didn't so why was Christianity one of them is because of the supernatural power of the Christian faith and Ehrman uh, acknowledges that these miracles uh, influenced people to believe good article to read is uh, Timothy Paul Jones Timothy Paul Jones is a good article to read
Timothy Paul Jones. Who wrote the Gospels? Timothy Paul Jones. It's an excellent article. And he goes into the early um, titles of the Gospels. Some scholars say, even, even evangelicals like Bloomberg say the Gospels were anonymous. But all the, all the uh, early manuscripts show that it's Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And Bart Ehrman says, oh, there's a bit of variety in these uh, manuscripts. In, 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 uh, when it says, Matthew, uh, the Gospel according to John, or the Gospel of John. So there can be a variety, but it says John, says Matthew, says Mark, Luke. So all the early evidence and, that we have of the Gospels is they had titles, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. If there were dis if it was not the case that they were anonymous, then we would see discrepancies. We'd see jo Matthew being named as Paul's letter uh, gospel, or we'd see it under different names. But we don't. Every time we see a gospel of Matthew, it's name on it Matthew. Every time we see a gospel of Luke, it's Luke. So this idea that the gospels were anonymous is is absolute nonsense. And also, papyri had little labels put on. Uh, of the writers so obviously early copies those labels would have fallen off but we don't have any early copies like that any copies that we do have have the titles on and that is from Timothy Paul Jones showing you that they were written by Matthew Mark Luke and John Uh, historical information that verifies the Bible is history or the New Testament, the crucifixion victim. An ancient burial site was uncovered containing 35 bodies, one named Yahun Ban Hagogol, and a 17 inch nail through his feet, showing you that there was crucifixion in Jerusalem. The Nazareth Decree. The Nazareth Decree is a marble slab found in Nazareth, 1878, inscribed with a decree issued. 41 AD by Emperor Claudia to the effect that Claudius to the effect that no grave should be disturbed or bodies extracted with offenders sentenced to death a plausible explanation of both the degrees and its location is that Claudius heard of Jesus empty tomb so here's a, an emperor 41 AD saying if you take away a body from a grave you'll die right so when Hamza laughs and says these bodies in Matthew came out, right? Well, maybe, maybe because Jesus got resurrected, they got resurrected. Maybe the Emperor Claudius was sick and tired of hearing about these stories <laughs> and made that decree. Leprosy in the first century. Some have suggested that there was no leprosy. Uh, Lepre or Hansen or Hansen disease in the Middle East in Jesus' day. However, thanks to archaeology, there's now dramatic evidence of its existence in the early 1st century. Scientific testing of the burial shroud, the so-called shroud tomb, has confirmed the presence of leprosy. The Polytarch inscription. Paul and his companion have passed through Anthropolis and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica. And this is Acts chapter 17, 1, 10. The Greek translated here as officials is polytarch. Since the term doesn't appear in classical literature, critics of the New Testament asserted for many years that Luke was mistaken in his use of the term polytarchs for the officials of Thessalonica. However, the, an inscription using the term was found in the first century AD town in 1867 by T.C. Mitchell. Showing you how accurate the New Testament is. Um, in the video, Hamza, in the video, I've not got through all the evidence that I was going to use on them. In the video, 
uh, Amza said there were contradictions in the Gospels. But we see, we see that in the Gospels there is many, many similarities. Uh, Jesus ministers while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. In AD 26-36, Matthew 27-2, Mark chapter 15-1, Luke chapter 3 verse 1, John 18-29. Caiaphas the high priest, Matthew 26-3, 26-57, Luke chapter 3 verse 2, John 11-49, etc. Annas was high priest, Luke chapter 3 verse 2, John chapter 18 verse 13-24. Jesus' family, Joseph is, father of Je is the father of Jesus, Matthew to 24 Luke chapter 1 27 24 Jesus mother is mentioned in Matthew chapter 47 Mark chapter 3 31 32 Luke chapter 8 19 20 John chapter 2 verse 1 and 3 I'll give you the article I'll give you the article similarities among gospel this is bible.org similarities among John's gospels Bible.org Geography and location Jesus first ministers in Galilee Matthew 4.12 Mark chapter 1 verse 14.16 Luke chapter 4.14 John chapter 1.43 His ministers in the town of Capernaum by the lake of Galilee Matthew chapter 4 verse 13 Chapter 8 verse 5 Chapter 17.24 Mark chapter 1.21 Luke chapter 4.23 John chapter 2.12 etc. He ministers to entire towns and regions that come out to see him. Matthew chapter 14 verse 34, Mark chapter 1 verse 35, John chapter 3 22, uh, John chapter 4 1 3. He ministers to Judea or to Judeans. Matthew chapter 4 25, Mark chapter 3 verse 7, Luke chapter 4 44, John chapter 3 22. He often ministers in Galilee around its lake. Matthew chapter 4 verse 18, Mark chapter 1 28, Luke 4, 31, etc. John chapter 4, verse 3. What I'm showing here, when they say there are contradictions, there's this mass of similarities, which shows you that they're not contradictions. To say there are two angels at the tomb and one angel is not a contradiction. One's just said two, one just mentions one. But what I'm showing you here is a mass of information showing you how they are similar. And mention similar things. They forget, forget that. Um, just, uh, is it in here? Still going, Jay. Still going. We're still going. Kosterberg and Bok and Chatra also offer advice when people are using so-called contradictions about the Gospels. This is in uh, Evidence Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. You can get the scholars here. And it says this, Many scholars acknowledge that Mark and Luke offer different perspectives on Jesus' life, and as Ehrman has pointed out, also his death, the central question appeared to be whether it is illegitimate for two authors to highlight different aspects of Jesus' death and whether these different aspects are incompatible. It is reasonable to assume that Jesus experienced a series of diverse emotions as he died on the cross. A closer look at Luke's version shows something interesting in relationship to Mark. Mark tells, Mark tells us that Jesus cried in, out a second time while on the cross. However, Mark does not tell us what Jesus said then. Luke has the text from Psalm 31.5 at the very point of Mark as a second foot unspecified cry for Jesus. Now most scholars see Luke as using a knowing Mark, so it is not at all unreasonable to see Luke supplying a detail that Mark lacked. So you've got to be careful when you're saying there are contradictions in the Gospels. Maybe one Gospel supplying something that another Gospel has lacked, as it says, okay? What else is there? Whoa, whoa, okay. We've got some more information here. 
So here is my Jewish scholarship. This is my Jewish scholarship that I did. We've only just touched two thirds. Um, next thing I want to say, a lot of people say, oh, um, the Gospels uh, would have changed over time. Uh, the Gospels would have um, would have um, uh, the, 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 you know the, the, the Gospels would have just uh, people would have done Chinese whispers and it would have changed over time okay and, and that the disciples were not educated and, and what have you this is uh, the sketches of Jewish social life by Alfred Erdersheim and he uses this book you can get today and he uses Jewish sources and in his chapter on um, education His chapter on education, the education that went on of Jewish children. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, get the chapter. It's subjects of study, home education in Israel, female education, schools and schoolmasters. So this is the this is a chapter by Erdersheim on the education system in the time of Jesus. It's uh, page one two two. Now, he mentions that, Jew that, that Jewish youth were taught to memorize as much as they could. Um, so, for example, uh, the Mishnah says, and he quotes, and this is what was going on in the time, that if you don't memorize uh, the rabbinic sayings, so that that's the teaching of the rabbis of that time on 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 the Old Testament. You should die. Okay, you should die. So I think they took memory pretty seriously. <laughs> that's the first point. Second is, he mentions that there were round up that there are historical sources. That seemed to say there were at least 400 schools in the time of Jesus around Jerusalem. That there, there was this education system where, where the synagogue would pay uh, for a schoolmaster. And the schoolmaster would gather the children and would do about four hours a day. There were certain times of the year they couldn't hit the children. <laughs> but the children were taught and educated. Even there was even provision for the poor at the temple. At the temple, there was gifts that were given for the poor so that they could have an education. So synagogues hired um, hired in the time of Jesus hired a schoolmaster to teach. And these children were taught early on to remember the Old Testament. To remember the rabbinic sayings. And the main education that they had was the Old Testament. So what does that mean? It means when Jesus is doing his work, his disciples are already educated. When it says in the book of Acts, they are unlearned, it doesn't mean to say they weren't educated. It just means that the 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 scholars of the Sahindrin didn't see them as scholars like them. But the education system was quite strong and robust in the time of Jesus. So people were getting extremely educated, even poor people, in the Old Testament and trained to in their memory, memorization. And you can find all the information, the documentation, uh, the ancient sources that he uses from that in Erdersheim sketches of Jesus. Now that, that's important because Bart Ehrman, a modern scholar who's attacked the Bible, says that the Jewish 
uh, that the disciples couldn't have written the Gospels because they weren't educated. And he doesn't even understand first century Judaism about the education system. Now, Erdersheim says the, the references are that there are 400 schools, but he says maybe there are a few, not as many as 400, but there were definitely at least two to 300 schools around Jerusalem. The text says 400, but there was definitely at least 300 schools around Jerusalem, around the Jerusalem area. Okay, so it shows you that there's no problem that they wrote the Gospels and it was based on eyewitness. They would have had good memories. They were trained to have good memories. They were trained to memorize things. They were, they were educated. Even the poorest were, were given an education. There were gifts at the temple specifically to help the poor so that they could have a schoolmaster to be educated. And that's in... Um, Erdersheim's book so that gives good solid evidence that the four gospels are rooted in uh, good history that these they would have been faithful now this is a a book uh, an article that you can read messianic expectations of the first first century now if you turn with me to uh, the gospel of John Gospel of John chapter 4. Turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 4. Gospel of John chapter 4. We're now going to prove the New Testament is first century literature in the time of Jesus. So that will enhance that it's going to, that, that it's based in the time of Jesus and it's good, historical, helpful information about Jesus' life. So if you go to John chapter 4. I'm coming, I'm coming. Some of them, Gareth, yeah, some of them you gave me, brother, yeah. I'll just get the text, I've got the text here, sorry. got it written down here I couldn't remember yeah Luke uh, John chapter 4 25 and 26 if you turn with me to John uh, 24 John chapter 4 if you turn with me to John chapter 4 verse 25 and 26 he says the woman said unto him I know the Messiah cometh which is called Christ when he has come he will tell us all things so that's uh, John chapter 4 25 26 so there we heard the word Messiah used the anointed one now if you read this article Messianic expectations of the first century it gives you all the quotations it gives you the Septuagint translation it gives you Jewish apocrypha literature Jewish Pseudographer, Dead Sea Scrolls, Philo and Josephus, the Targumans. So looking at the Septuagint text, looking at Jewish Apocrypha, for example, I'll give you an example. Second Edrus, chapter 7, verse 26, he says, For my son, the Messiah. Second Edrus, Edrus 12, verse 31, 34, it says, This is the Messiah whom the Most High has kept until the end of days. So that is in the Jewish Apocrypha literature, we see 
the teaching about the Messiah. We see it also in 1 Maccabees chapter 4, 46, 1 Maccabees uh, chapter 9, 27. So there was great distress in Israel, such as not seen since the time of that prophet, that prophet ceased to appear among them. But what I'm is in the Maccabees text, there are indications of this end time where a prophet would come. 1 Maccabees 4, 1, the Jews and their priests have resolved that Simon should be their leader, our high priest forever, until a trustworthy prophet should arise. 1 Maccabees 14, 41. What I'm trying to show you is in early Jewish literature, at the time of Jesus, just before Jesus, in the time of Jesus, and even after Jesus, there was an expectation of the Messiah. Jewish pseudoographer, that's literature just near the time of Jesus, just after Jesus. One Enoch says, this is the son of man. Chapter 46, verse 1. One Enoch 48, 2, 10. It says the son of man. One Enoch 40, 52, 4. Says the Messiah. One Enoch 62, 5. Says that the son of man. One Enoch 62, 7. For the son of man. These are messianic titles. They're expecting a Messiah. So when we read the John chapter about this the the samaritan woman said the messiah is coming it shows you how historical the gospel of john is and how the new testament is it there was this big expectation of a messiah coming i could read many 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 more pieces uh to Baruch, chapter 40 verse 1 my anointed one testament of eli the lord will raise up a new priest his star will rise in heaven like a king this is messianic language the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, the Kumanic Apocalypse, 4Q246 says, Son of God, and they call him the Son of the Most High. Um, 1QS, the rule of the community, Col 9, verse 9b11, it says, Until the prophets come and the Messiah of Aaron and Israel. So the Dead Sea Scrolls show a messianic, they're looking for a messiah. They all had different views about the messiah. So I'll get to that in a minute. In a minute, the work, the work of Philo and Josephus, the life of Moses. Philo writes, "There shall come forth from one day a man, and he shall rule over many nations." This Philo, Josephus mentions a divine inspiration for 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 fostering revolutionary changes. Messi talking about future Messiah, the Tigron. The, the Tigrons, the word Messiah occurs in the following. This is the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. Uh, they translate the word Messiah in Genesis 3.15. They are destined to make peace at the end of the day of King Messiah. And there are many, many verses of the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament where they put the word Messiah in. So what does that tell us? Oh, we can look at the... the Literature after Jesus, early Titanic rabbinical writers, Mishnah, in the Mishnah, now with the footprints of the Messiah, presume will increase. The Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud, um, in uh, Tan Anet, chapter 4, verse 8, Rabbi Simeon ben Johanna said, etc., this is the king. The Messiah, Rabbi Johann, etc. So even after Jesus, in the Rabbi, in right, so literature before Jesus mentioning the Messiah, literature in the Dead Sea Scrolls mentioning rabbinic writings, the Mishnah, etc. Ta uh, the Talmud mentioning Messiah. Now they had different views of the Messiah. Some of them, some of them believed that there was going to be a priestly Messiah and a kingly Messiah, right? But the point what I'm trying to get at is the New Testament is in a Jewish context. It's not a, a, a it's not a, it, it fits the time of of the Jerusalem, of the time that Jesus lived. So the Gospels are. Uh, permeated full of the juice of 
Full of the time of Jesus. Full of the time of Jesus. So anybody who says all oh, the Gospels were not written in the time of, uh, in the first century, they were written in the second or third century, uh, they were anonymous and all that, it's, it's total nonsense when you look. It's, this is rooted. They, they, they believe Jesus was the Messiah. So this is in the context of messianic expectation before, during, after the time of Jesus. So if they were thinking that Jesus was the Messiah, they're going to be very, very careful in how they write and what they write. Uh, a good book to read is Easter is the Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright. In his mammoth work, N.T. Wright, The Resurrection of the Son of God, in his mammoth book, he mentions, so uh, N.T. Wright's The Resurrection of the Son of God, it's a massive book like that, he mentions that the Jews generally believed in a physical resurrection. So if Jesus, if you're saying Jesus didn't die, why is it the Jews, the New Testament writers say that Jesus rose from the dead, which is a physical resurrection. The Jews didn't believe in a spiritual resurrection, but a physical resurrection. These are Jews. So if these Jews, if N.T. Wright is correct that the Jews did not believe in a spiritual resurrection, but a physical resurrection, it means that they believe Jesus really did die on a cross. Because it died and it was a physical resurrection. Uh, the Gospels as Historical Testimony by Paul Merkel. The Gospels as Historical Testimony by Paul Merkel. Very good article if you want to think about historiography. If you want to think about historiography, uh, it is very, very good. And... Uh, In talks about his uh, eyewitness material. And, and, he, and he's just saying that everything's based on... We can't really do history if we don't take eyewitness material seriously. And he's saying if you're just throwing out the New Testament as not eyewitness, you're doing a disservice to the literature, you're doing a disservice to history. You have to take it seriously, and he was saying that a lot of reasons why the, the the a lot of reasons why the eyewitness material is not taken seriously in the Gospels is not because of the Gospels. Uh, it's because that scholars in the past have been influenced by philosophy, like modernists who didn't believe in miracles and things, and these have shaped uh, the way historical inquiry has been done since the 19th century. There's been this prejudice against miracles. So this is in. So for example, when Jesus predicts, when Jesus predicts uh, the fall of the temple, many scholars date the New Testament after the fall of the temple. Reason being, because oh he couldn't have written it because that's a miracle, prophesying it would happen. So he couldn't. It couldn't have been written before the Gospels. Couldn't have been the, the sorry the Book of Acts and. Matthew, Mark and Luke couldn't have been written before uh, the temple because he prophesied the fall of the temple. So you see this bias against miracles is making people date the Gospels according to that bias and he's calling that out. Another issue is, uh, this is from uh, John Young's church by uh, John Godfrey uh, at the Messianic Fellowship. You can get this information. But in uh, Daniel chapter 9 verse 2, so we're just looking at the Jewish context. This is the, my argument against Hamza and Ijaz, the Jewish context. The Gospels are in a Jewish context. And so, you know, this is not material just produced by people all over the place and, and just anonymous. This is people from the area of Jesus, the time of Jesus, etc. So we looked at the Jewish context. And... Uh, in Daniel chapter 9 verse 1 and 2 it says in the year of Darius the son of Azorah the lineage of the mids who was made king of the realm of the first year of his reign I Daniel understood by the books the number of years specified of the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years of desolation of Jerusalem this is the article
And what I wanted to say is that uh, in Jeremiah chapter 25, 8 and 11, it says, this is about the temple. We're talking about the temple. In the time of Daniel, it prophesied that there, there would be this going into captivity and coming back. Jeremiah 25, chapter 8 and 11, there is this prophecy, 70 year prophecy in Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesies that during Ju prophesies that because Judah had not in heeded the warnings of Jeremiah and other prophets, Jeremiah 25, 37, the Lord would use Nebuchadnezzar, he calls my servant, to take families of Judah captive and the nation would serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Jeremiah 25, 8 and 11. Because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishing hissing and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of milestone, and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years, Jeremiah 25, 8, 11. Why am I talking about this? Because there's lots of scriptures, Jeremiah 29, 10 and 14, 2 Chronicles 26, um, Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, 2 Chronicles 36, 22, 33. 2 Kings chapter 21, 19 and 15. 2 Kings chapter 22, 15 and 20. 2 Kings chapter 23, 22. 2 Kings chapter 23, 26, 27. Uh, there's lots of scriptures talking about the temple. The, for the Jews, the temple is central. They were broken hearted that they had to leave Jerusalem and be taken into captivity. The temple was central. So you see here, uh, the the Cyrus Cylinder, which talks about uh, Jews sent back home from captivity so they could build the temple. So why am I why am I mentioning this? So you could read Ezra chapter four verse four and five, Ezra four twenty four. But if you want to read the article, here's the article notes by John Godfrey at the Messianic Fellowship in Manchester, the Jacob's Ladder. It's a very very good article. And there's a nice uh, picture at the back. The point that I want to get at is that anybody who who comes and and claims to be the Messiah, okay, like Jesus did, you have the temple. That is the focus of attention, the temple. All right, so. If the Gospels are history, right, there would have to be some issues concerning the temple, because that was the central. That was central. And we see the issue. We see that Jesus is claiming to be the temple. We see uh, him going into the temple and throwing over everybody, because the, 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 the wicked things they were doing, selling things and making money. We see the power struggle with, with the Pharisees him because they control the temple, but Jesus is getting more followers. So what I'm saying is the Gospels give us that picture. That's what the Jews would be interested in. That's what's the focus of their religious life, the temple. We see that in the Jewish history. So the four Gospels portray this, showing you that they're, they're in line with the historical time frame of that time. So that's another evidence that the Gospels are not just fabrication, they're not just inventions. These are texts that are written by serious people who, who are serious about what they believe. And that's the, oh, the Jewish context. Again, uh, this is a good book to read for Jewish evangelism. But on Isaiah, uh, in the book, page 17... He talks about rabbis that 
that don't like Isaiah 53, so they, they made two Isaiahs in later rabbinic writing in modern times to try and get round Isaiah 53 and the suffering Lord. And he, and he goes into that. But he mentions rabbinic writers such as Rashi, who's a Hebrew, who, who is a, a middle-aged uh, rabbi scholar. And this middle-aged rabbi, rabbi scholar, uh, Rashi, uh, is seen as very, very uh, authoritative. And he says uh, that uh, Isaiah and Zechariah uh, refer to a suffering Messiah. And you can, so that's, so he goes into the rabbinic, so Muslims will say Isaiah 53, when it mentions Jesus dying in Isaiah 53, if we go to uh, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, some people say, Isaiah 53 It says All we like sheep have gone astray We have turned everyone to his own way And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all He was oppressed and he was afflicted Etc So it talks about the death of Christ there In fact we'll read We'll read some of it Isaiah 53 So this is a prophecy of the death of Christ. He is despised and rejected, verse 3, Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned away every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord, verse 10, to bruise him. It put him to grief, etc. So this, this guy here has collected Rashti. Rashti does try to, as Gareth has said, try to uh, change the meaning, but he, he unwittingly admits But Zechariah 10, 12, 10 has proven to be a powerful scripture as look upon me whom they have pierced emphasize mine in context Zechariah 12, 9, 10 It shall be in that day that I shall seek to destroy all the nations that come up against Jerusalem and I will pour out the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication then they will look upon me, whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourn for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for the firstborn. Zechariah 12, 9, 10. It is interesting to note that the Septuagint and Tumult have the notion of both Talmud and Rashni, the most famous Jewish rabbinic medieval commentator, 1040, 1105, say that this land one is the Messiah. However, they say it is Messiah, son of Joseph, that is to come up from a line of Joseph, Jacob's son. So, what I'm saying is, these rabbinic scholars like Rashni, they admit the Messiah can suffer, but then they split it and make two Messiahs to try and hide that it's Jesus. So they don't say it's Israel. There are ancient rabbinic scholars that don't say it's Israel, but say it's Messiah. But they split it to try and get away from Jesus. Okay. And um, just to say that Jesus actually quotes Isaiah 53 as something uh, concerning him. And I'm just trying to get my sources here.
Yeah, this is a, a liberal scholar, so he's not evangelical. Uh, Joachim Jeremiah's the central message of the New Testament. So he's not a, a scholar on my side or anything. He says, in the second place, the words for many are a reference in Isaiah 53, as Mark 10.45 confirms the substitution as well as the word many alludes to just the passage for many. So if you turn to Mark 10.45... Mark 10.45 Mark 10.45 It says, For even the Son of Man came not to minister unto, but to minister, and give his life a ransom for many. So even Jesus says he's going to die. But the word ransom for many, this liberal scholar, Jeremiah, is saying the word many is coming out of Isaiah 53 it, 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 it's, it's like a, a taken uh, as as a, an exposition of Isaiah 53 this is what a liberal scholar says ok so we not only have rabbinic testimony we also have uh, liberal scholarship and Jesus, most of all, referring Isaiah 53 to himself. So we've nearly finished, but we need to go on to Pauline scholarship. Uh, Pauline scholarship. So I have some books. A book on Pauline scholarship. You want to read Pauline scholarship. Uh, Paul's outline. Herman Redebos. Outline there. Now, this article, Paul and Historical Jesus, the case of First Corinthians, yeah, uh, Psalmist David, Ant Anthony, yeah, messianic claims in. The suffering servant is also in Psalm uh, 22, where it says, They pierced my hands and my feet, uh, and the bulls of Basha. So if you read Psalm 22, that is messianic. But there are many messianic psalms, which we'll get into. Um, uh, if you read uh, Erdersheim, Erdersheim's book, The Life of the Messiah, he lists all the messianic scriptures in the Old Testament that point to Christ but the point is here is that Paul alludes to the historical Jesus this is the article here because the argument is that Paul was not accurate about saying Jesus died on the cross what we've looked at here is the Jewish context we've looked at the Jewish context of the temple the Jewish context of Isaiah 53 and Zechariah and we've looked at the uh, Jewish context of, of, of an understanding of the Messiah throughout the literature. And as Brother uh, Anthony's quite rightly said in the Psalms, uh, there's many references to the Messiah, which we could have gone into. But one argument that the Muslims will use is that Paul is not an eyewitness and Paul didn't really know what he was talking about, that he was lying. But... Uh, Paul and the historical Jesus, a case study in 1 Corinthians, uh, shows you that well, there's so much, I'm, I'm getting tired now. So, an, an example is 1 Corinthians 9 14, which says, So the Lord ordained those who answered the gospel to live from the gospel. So that's direct teaching from Jesus in Paul. So Paul was accurately... There's another one where he talks about the supper. I don't know if it's in here. But when the Lord says, you know, he talks about the supper and he says, you know, this is my body broken for you. And, and Paul's doing the, uh, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. He's quoting Jesus. He's quoting him. 
So what I'm sh trying to show you is that Paul was concerned about uh, passing on what Jesus taught accurately. It wasn't just about making it up. So for example, so Paul, you know, the argument that Muslims make is, did Jesus make it up? Did you, uh, sorry, did Paul make up? Did Paul make it up? Did he make up Christianity and invent it? The doctrine of the atonement is in Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 12. Jesus taught it in Matthew 10, 38, 16, 24. So let's turn to Matthew 10, 38. Matthew... 10.38 Matthew 10.38 And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Matthew 16.24 Then Jesus said if any man will not come after me, let him deny himself and take up of his cross and follow me. Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. Okay. Mark chapter 8, 34. Mark 8, 34. And when he called the people, he said, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny him and take up the cross and follow me. Mark chapter 14, 24. He said, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. So, there is a, a reference to the cross and and the atonement there, especially mainly in those. Uh, this is my blood given for you. Now Paul didn't make it up. He didn't make this doctrine of atonement up. Jesus was teaching it. So in one Corinthians chapter, 1, Ephesians chapter two verse eight and sixteen, Colossians chapter one twenty, chapter two verse fourteen. Paul teaches atonement, Jesus taught atonement. Others, uh, John chapter 1, 29, Acts chapter 8, 32, 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. Other New Testament writers also... Uh, to, you, doctrine, uh, believe in Jesus for eternal life. Uh, so Jesus taught believe in Jesus to, for eternal life Matthew nineteen twenty nine Matthew nineteen twenty nine and everyone that hath forsaken house and brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake shall receive a thunderbolt and shall inherit everlasting life. So that's a, a queer statement that you've got to give your life for Christ if you're going to get saved. So you can go Mark chapter 10, 29, 30, Luke chapter 9, 24, John chapter 3, verse 16. And Jesus, uh, Paul taught to believe in Christ you're saved. Romans chapter 5, 21, Romans 6, 23. So what we're seeing is Paul didn't just make things up. He didn't make his own Christian faith up. He, he, he was teaching what Jesus taught. Uh, Jesus was a word of Paul was aware of Jesus' teaching. An example, the power of the sower. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and 10. Matthew chapter 13, 1 to 21. The stumbling stone. Romans chapter 9, 33. Matthew 18, 7. Ruling against divorce. 1 Corinthians 7, 10. Mark 10 and 11. Etc. So we're seeing that Paul did not invent Christianity. He was trying to follow what Jesus taught. And this, this article by Rich Dean. Did Paul invent Christianity? Rich Dean is a good article 
to get hold of lots, lots of information there. So we're coming near the end, you'll be glad. We're coming near the end. So the last one where Christian apologists struggle with Ijaz is on the issue of uh, textual criticism and word studies of the Bible. So this is the final bit of my defence of their So here, if we go to uh, Mark, if you turn to uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 24, when they had crucified him, they parted the garments casting lots. That's Mark 15:24. Now, Ijaz will say, well, if we looked at the textual variants and the way the Greek is, it doesn't mean crucify, right? I checked it with one, I checked it with two Greek interlinears, I checked it with three, I checked it with four Greek interlinears, all right? Of different, different uh, scholars, different methods of textual criticism, all translate uh, Mark chapter 10, 15, verse 24, that Jesus is crucified. All the manuscripts uh, mentioned, they've come in those uh, translations of the Greek, they've put. So when you're doing word studies and you're trying to do word studies, be very careful with these Muslim scholars because, Muslim debaters, because they'll try and say, oh, the word crucify is not in there. There's a textual variant. But I've just shown you that if you check with your Greek interlinears and with other Greek interlinears, that it, it, that's what it says. That's what it says in the Greek. You can actually read the Greek and the English underneath. So how he tries to uh, weasel out that the word crucify doesn't mean to crucify is ridiculous. Uh, I want to introduce you to a book called The Exegetical Fallacies. This is, this, this is a rebuttal of Ijaz on his textual criticism. And in here, uh, D.A. Carlson warns against this, just using word studies. And, 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 and you know, texts are in the, in the units. So we need to look at words in the units, and he warns against this. And Ijaz takes a word and roots it out of its semantic and historical and contextual context and makes up a, a, a meaning using some kind of weird textual variant. But the reality is, if you just do a bit of scholarship yourself, look at a few other Greek uh, interlinears, which I have done. So I've got one, two, three, four, five Greek interlinears to check Ijaz. And it shows that he's not being honest when he's quoting uh, scriptures and saying that it, crucify doesn't mean crucify in the Greek text. And I also checked it w with this uh, parallel um, book and in Mark 10, so we're on about the crucifixion. I'm, I'm showing you the textual evidence because he's saying that the word crucify doesn't mean crucify. There's a textual variant in another manuscript. And I've just shown you five different Greek scholars, five different Greek group of scholars doing translations of the Greek, reading from Greek, using Greek manuscripts, that they've translated it crucify. <laughs> There's five different ones. Now, in uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 24, we're camping on this verse. Mark 10, 24. Mark 10, 24 says, And they crucified him. 
right? And it's in Matthew, and it's in Luke. So it's in three other manuscripts, okay? It's in other Gospels. Now, here's the point. Not only is it in the Greek manuscripts, but it's in Marcion, Irenaeus, and Origen. So it has other, not just Greek manuscripts of the, the, the Gospel of Mark, it's also in uh, Marcion, Irenaeus, and Origen. So the word crucify is, is a word that, that is verified in the text, the Greek text. And it not just come, it comes from de many different Greek scholars and many uh, and a number of ancient manuscripts that are not not gospels like Irenaeus. Uh, I've just mentioned the the. I mean, I had to do a lot of work to get this. So you got Marcion, Irenaeus, and Origen. All right, quoting that section. Nearly done. So, Ijaz uses kind of Bart Ehrman's method. Bart Ehrman was asked in an interview. He was asked, you, uh, you question the text of the New Testament, you know, it, that it's been corrupted. So, what does the New Testament look like? This is what Bart Ehrman was asked. And he said this, it looks like what we see today. So he contradicted himself. He says that the text has been corrupted, but he's saying the text, what we see today, is what it was in the time of the beginning. So he, in, a, in an interview, he contradicted himself. So you've got to be careful with these scholars. Now, this article is an absolute... If you want to do bar... Bart Scholarship, this article by Thomas Holt, is an absolutely brilliant, uh, it's called uh, A Response to Bart Ehrman's Misquoting Jesus. It's a really good article, and I just want to camp on something which uh, he does. In Bart Scholarship, he, does, he has many fallacies. Uh, and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he gives many conjectures that he's not being honest about. One thing that I found very interesting reading this. Just trying to find it. Yeah. The, some, one of the fallacies that Bart Ehrman uses and which Ijaz uses is that the earliest manuscripts are the best. And this is a, a logical and textual fallacy because just because something early doesn't necessarily mean it's the best. You could have two copies, right? One that's late, that's been accurately copied, and one that's early and not been accurately copied. That's a possibility. So to say the manuscript's early is necessarily the best needs qualification. And so what uh, Maurice Roberts did is he took later manuscripts that Bart Ehrman doesn't use, wouldn't use and he took a group of them. I'll, I'll read what he did. Maurice A. Robertson, a senior professor of Greek and New Testament at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary did a detailed study comparing manuscripts. His explanation of this study, though lengthy, is necessary in order to grasp the significance of the findings. More than a century ago, the pre papyri era, Westcott and Hort stated that in their estimation, at least seven-eighths of the New Testament text, 87%, were, was secure and required no criticism whatsoever. For that massively high percentage of accepted common text, the implication was clear in those portions of text the autographs are presented in total purity. Only in the 12.5% of the text does textual criticism play any role whatsoever. 
The current issue is whether Westcott and Hawke were correct in their estimation or whether the actual amount of unquestioned autographs originality might have changed in the light of the papyri discovers, particularly if early and late MS that pre, uh, represent widely varying textual traditions are compared. Not so, such a study yet appears to have been done in order to test the earlier claim of West Grand Hort. The current essay serves as a sample exposition and establishment of the correctness or incorrectness of the original claim in light of the papyri discovered since in 1881. In order to accomplish this test, some 30 randomly selected, randomly selected MS of the 2nd and 3rd centuries are collated against the Byzantine text form, Robertson Pierpoint edition. Such a collation is particularly appropriate since it is well known that none of those early documents, indeed no extent Greek New Testament manuscript prior to the mid 4th century, yet reflects a thoroughly Byzantine type text. Thus the amount of textual diversity and diversion would be maximised in such a test. So what he did is he took 30 texts, some from the Alexandrian era, uh, from the um, second and third century, and some from the Middle Ages. And this is what he found. So apparently the Middle Age text would be really, really bad. All right. This is what he found. 94% nine, 94% accuracy. All those texts together, there's only a small percentage that they're different. 92% uh, sorry, 94% accuracy on Matthew chapter 13. 92.1 accuracy in Acts chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. 94.2% accuracy. Hebrews chapter 13, 96.8% accuracy. Revelation 13, 91.7% accuracy. Robertson's study shows that there is, on average, 92-point average stability in the text during the very period that Ehrman asserts the greater number of variants were introduced into the manuscripts. Thus, there is much more to Robertson's study than we can present so that what it's showing you is that the New Testament was accurately copied over the centuries and there's a tenacity to the text. A tenacity. In other words, it's, it, the, nobody came in and tried to change and swap and, and, and make uh, a new religion by different textual variants. No, there was a tenacity of the copying. There was an accuracy. Morris Roberts Studies does that. The other thing about Bart Ehrman and Ijaz and others, they'll say like the last ending of Mark is not in there, uh, the last, the, the woman are committing adultery, but even in one of the manuscripts, Sinaticus of Vaticanus, uh, one of them, there is a rub mark showing you that they knew the, the woman who committed adultery in the Gospel of John was in there, but they decided not to put it in. The last ending of Mark, one of the manuscripts, Sinaiticus of Vaticanus, leave a mark, a gap, so that that could be written in. They knew it existed. Bart Ehrman and Ijaz and modern scholars don't tell you this. All right? Even the Jonai comma, is it 1 John 5, 7? Even that is a textual variant in Sinaiticus of Vaticanus. The modern scholars don't tell you this. All right? So that's done. We're done. So be careful when it just comes to you with your, his textual criticism. Be very, very careful. Make sure you've got some ammunition on the textual issue if you're ever debating because he'll call you out and he'll try and make you look stupid. So we're done. I've done as best I can. I've done Pauline scholarship for you. I've done textual criticism scholarship for you. I've done Jewish scholarship for you liberal scholarship for you, Islamic scholarship for you, to prove to you that when it says Jesus was crucified, he was crucified. Why did he die? He died as a saviour. It? it says in Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53 verse 10 Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him 
he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, and he shall see his seed, he shall pro prolong his day, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Christ died on a cross to save us, my friends. He gave his life that you may have life. There's no other way to be saved but Jesus Christ. It says in Psalm 2, turn with me to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. It says, Why do the heathen rage? Psalm 2. And the people imagine a vain thing. The king of the earth set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy ill Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and thy uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now therefore, O you kings, be instructed, you judges. Kiss the son lest he be angry, you perish from the wrath, when his wrath is kindled, but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him, kiss the son, you need to believe in Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Saviour, you need to trust him, and look to him, I've done this scholarship today, look at all the scholarship, look at it, look, I've done that to refute Hamza and Ijaz, Muslim apologies, not to win an argument. It's because I love them and I love you and I want you to know Christ. That if you die without Christ, you are lost. If you die without him, all your textual knowledge, if you don't know Christ, if you don't kiss the sun, Ijaz, you're lost, bro. Hamza, you can be very clever and smart and outwit your opponent if you want but if you don't kiss the sun you're dead bro you need Christ you need to know that Christ is the saviour that Christ is the Lord that Christ shed his blood Jesus says come unto me all you who are weak and heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon me and learn of me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light you need to trust him you need to look to him I don't agree with the Q source, I, I, I think it's a load of nonsense, there's no such thing as the Q source. But scholars say there is a Q source, well I had a look at the Q source, and there's an allusion to the cross in the Q source. So if you want to get technical and scholarship, there we are, but it's not about scholarship. At the end of the day, it's about whether you put your faith in Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life, no one can come to the Father but through me. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And unless you turn to Christ, you'll be lost. He is the answer to everything. He is the way forward. He is the only hope. So my dear friends, put your faith in Christ. He was perfect and pure. He never lied. He never did anything wrong. He is a holy Savior, a holy God. He is a wonderful Savior. So please, my friends, put your faith in Christ. Trust Him. Look to Him. Have faith in Him. There's other sources that we could have looked at. The historical record of Thallus 52 that says there was a darkness. The historical record of Pliny the Younger 61, 113 says that Christians believed in the resurrection. The historical record of Suetonius 61, 40. We've looked at Tacitus in another video. The historical record of Bar Sapion 70 AD. Historical record of Philagon, Lucian of Samosa, 115-200 AD, Philagon, 80-140, and Celsus, 175. Historical record of Josephus, we looked at, 37-101. Historical record of the Jewish Talmud, 400-700 AD. Historical record of the Toledot Yeshua, 100 AD. That Jesus says he was God. Matthew 5.18 identified himself with God's own name sorry he prefaced his statements as though he was God in Matthew 5.10 he identified himself with his own 
God's own name, I am, in John 8, 45, 58. He talked as though he was equal with God in John 14, 6, 9. He said he that he and he were, were and God were one in John 20, 25, 29. He demonstrated omniscience, John chapter 4, 16, 30. He demonstrated omnipresence, Matthew 28, 20. He demonstrated omnipotence in John chapter 11, 38, 44, Mark 6, 48. The wise man worshipped him at his birth, Matthew chapter 2, 10 to 12. The leper worshipped him at his healing, Matthew 8, 2. The synagogue ruler worshipped him, Matthew 9. The disciples worshipped him in the boat, Matthew 14, 32, 33. The mother of James and John worshipped him, Matthew 20, 20, 20, chapter 20, 20 and 21. The woman, the blind man worshipped him at his healing, John chapter 9, 35, 38. The woman worshipped him at the empty tomb, uh, Matthew 28, verse 8 to 10. The, he fulfilled the Old Testament. The Messiah will appear after the Jews return to Israel. Jeremiah 23, 3, 6. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. The Messiah would be preceded by a messenger, Isaiah 43. The Messiah would enter Jerusalem while riding on a donkey, Zechariah 9, 9. The Messiah would suffer and be rejected, Isaiah 53, 3. The Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, 13. The Messiah would be silent before his accusers, Isaiah 53, verse 7. The Messiah would be wounded, whipped and crucified, Isaiah 53. Verse 5. This is my video refuting refuting Ijaz and Hamza. And then my last scripture. Whether you believe it was written by John or not, it is a text that I believe John wrote it. It's a text that refers to Jesus' death in John chapter 1 and it is a first century literature in Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bore record of the word of God Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of his prophecy and keep those things which are written and therein for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was, and which is to come from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and had made us kings and priests unto God. Did you hear that? Verse 5. And from Jesus, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That is a reference to the atonement of Christ. So I hope we're done. I'm finished. And I hope that's a blessing to you. Now this took me two days to prepare. But my internet was not good for them, so... But it took me two days to prepare all this. And uh, I did my best, but I can't do this again. It took two days. And um, unless my internet's good, uh, it's not worth doing this again. Unless I had a formal debate with one of them and it was a formal academic debate, then it would be worth it. God bless you. Love to everybody out there. May God be with you. And I hope that this video will conv have convinced you that Christ died for our sin, gave his life for us, and I hope it was a blessing. God bless you and love to you all. God bless you.